My name is Decker Fraser. I was a vice president of marketing for Google Accelerator Startup. I was a product marketing manager for a Series D startup funded by Google. I was also a senior product marketing manager for a Series A startup in San Francisco, and I have been consulting for countless SaaS companies. I've written two product marketing books. I taught digital marketing at the college level, and I received my MBA in marketing from the number one ranked business school for marketing, Philip Kotler's Kellogg School of Management. This video is a free preview of the full SaaS marketing course, which you can download in the link in the description. Let's get started. The nine biggest SaaS marketing mistakes. Number one, obsessing over leads and marketing qualified leads, MQLs. A lot of the time, what I see with SaaS marketing is that the marketing department becomes very, very good at one thing, and that is generating free trials or generating demo requests. The problem is that there is a huge drop off in the middle of the funnel when that handoff happens from the marketing team to the sales team. Instead, what SaaS marketers should be doing is filling that chasm between marketing and sales because usually that is the low hanging fruit that you can fix without spending a lot of money. How do you do that? Well, I'm going to give you two very specific tactical examples. One, after somebody requests a demo, you immediately bring them to a calendar so that they can book the demo and schedule it. And then you send reminder emails to make sure they actually show up. But those reminder emails, it's not just reminding them when the demo is, it's continuing to sell the value proposition of the demo itself. You need to demonstrate to people that it is valuable for them to show up. So focus on that handoff from marketing to sales and you'll get a much bigger lift in your performance. Another tactical example, continue to market to people after they become an MQL. All too often marketers generate the demo request, they generate the free trial, and then they say mission accomplished. Mission not accomplished. You need to do retargeting. You need to continue to advertise to people that have become MQLs. You need to continue to send marketing emails to those people. Often this is the result of optimizing your budget per MQL, a cost per MQL. Instead, you should be looking at SQLs, SQOs, pipeline revenue. And what that may mean is that the cost for free trial sign up, the cost per demo request may actually go up, but the overall customer acquisition cost will come down. Okay, number two, the biggest strategic mistake that marketers make is they do not focus enough on partners. And there are different types of partners. One of the key ones that people ignore are key influencers. Key influencers are people that already influence your target customers. They already have clout. They already have credibility. One way you can find them is using this excellent tool called SparkToro. Influencer marketing, greatly underestimated. Other companies can also be partners. Other software companies. Usually in the SaaS space, there's some critical piece of software that has a tight relationship with your target customer. This is the CRM. This is the ERP, this is the accounting system, it's the practice management system. That is the ideal partnership. That's where the trust is, that is the integration hub. You can also partner with companies that are similar size to you. You can partner with companies that are smaller. You can partner with small scale influencers such as lawyers, accountants, web developers, designers, all sorts of different types of people that influence your target customer. Now this is particularly important when there's some trigger event where the demand for your product suddenly surges. So that might be something like a bankruptcy. Well, you're gonna want bankruptcy lawyers to know about your product because they're gonna influence the customer at that critical juncture. Now this mistake is super common. And the reason is because SaaS marketers typically define the target market as the target customer. This isn't true. Part of your target market is also the partners and you need to create value for partners just as much as you create 
value for end users and customers. Okay, number three, this obsession with inbound content marketing and in particular high level thought leadership. I don't know how many times I've looked at companies where they just keep cranking out content like they're journalists. Most SaaS companies, you're not the New York Times. You are not in the business of journalism. Usually what I see here is tons of value is created for the reader. The reader get, gets to solve their problem, they get entertaining content, they get useful information, but what's in it for the SaaS company if those people don't become customers? So usually what I see is tons of traffic through the blog. That's great, but if that doesn't convert to sales pipeline or to revenue, it doesn't really matter. So the solution is usually to stop focusing so much on high level thought leadership, unless you're a very large company, and start talking more about problems that are very closely tied and can easily segue to your product and the problem that your product solves. One of the biggest problems with inbound content marketing is that it just takes a lot of time. You might be at it for a year before you're ROI positive, and that's fine if you're in it for the long haul. I've worked at SaaS companies where they've already been around for 10 years, and, and that's great. They, they have a long-term vision. You can invest in that sort of thing. But if you're very ambitious and you want quick results, probably not the best way to go. The best way to go, I would say, in terms of efficiency, instead of building an audience from the ground up and building a followership so that you're like a journalistic entity, is latch on to people that already have it. Latch on to the influencers, latch on to the publications, the PR agents, people that already have massive followings that you can tap into. Okay, number four, SaaS marketers do not distinguish between a strategic purchase and a non-strategic purchase. They're not aware of this difference. So what most SaaS marketers do is they assume that they're selling a strategic purchase. Okay, so what is a strategic purchase? A strategic purchase is when you're buying a product that helps you differentiate your product to your customers. Okay, so for example, Jungle Scout is a strategic purchase. It's the software that allows Amazon sellers to figure out strategically what portfolio of products to offer. That's important because the portfolio of products differentiates one Amazon seller from another. But there are lots of SaaS companies, perhaps most SaaS companies, are non-strategic purchases. It doesn't differentiate, the SaaS does not differentiate your product to your target customers. An example of this would be a lot of these live chat plugins for your website. There's a bunch of them. And although they help with your revenue, they help with the customer engagement, they make communication easy, I love them. Uh, I've seen great performance with these. They're not strategic purchases because fundamentally, it doesn't change what you're selling and whether your customer chooses you or another. Okay, so the key problem there is that if you're marketing something as strategic purchase, you're usually, you wanna focus on how much different you are, you wanna quantify how much more money you save people, but you're wasting your time. When you're selling a non-strategic purchase, just sell at a fair price, focus on lubricating the sales process, make it seem as easy as possible. That's how you market a non-strategic purchase. Don't talk about high level benefits and how you're gonna completely change the company, completely revolutionize the profit, because if, if you talk like that, it's just gonna sound like marketing fluff, especially to target customers that are more technical. Okay, number five, the assumption that benefits matter more than features. Sometimes that's true, okay? High level benefits, sometimes that is the most important thing, especially when you're selling something that has psychological, emotional value. A lot of the time in SaaS, however, the use case is more technical, it's more feature centric, it's more based on functionality and outcomes that are not high level. So all too often when I go to a landing page or a home page for a SaaS company, they're talking in really abstract high level senses. We're going to save you tons of money. And I'm just thinking, okay, what the heck do you even do? What is your product? What's the product category? How are you going to save me money? It's too high level. Let's talk more about features. Let's talk more about specifics and use cases, less about high level benefits. Number six, brief copywriting. There's this myth 
that pithy writing is somehow better. And sometimes, yes, I mean, people only have so much time. But if you're just being brief, you're being witty, you're using one, two word sentences with periods, you're not giving me enough information to make a decision. And this is a common problem I see with marketers where they want to talk high level. They don't want to get into the nitty gritty of how the product creates value. They don't want to get into the technical because they're not product managers. They're not engineers. So they take the easy way out and they just say, oh, here's, here's kind of a, a, a high level brief overview. You can request a demo. And then what happens when they request the demo, they go into a conversation with the sales team. The sales team says this person's not qualified. They don't know enough of the product about the product. Instead, what you should do is provide lead generation is actually incredibly easy. The reason that marketers believe lead generation is difficult is because the way they go about it is wrong. They go about lead generation in a very indirect way. So for example, marketers will spend a lot of time writing thought leadership pieces, writing blog posts, writing long pieces of content that are interesting, that position the company well, but really do not move the needle when it comes to lead generation. And the reason is because those kinds of tactics are not explicitly designed to generate leads. So I'm going to give you an example of why it is incredibly easy to generate leads. The first is that you simply buy the leads. You go and you buy the list. You can get it from a list broker. You can get it from somebody who solicit, solicits you via email to purchase a list, and you can browse the internet. So for example, here's a company called Pipe Candy. With Pipe Candy, I can go and buy a list of nutraceutical companies, a list of Shopify Plus stores, a list of direct-to-consumer brands. These are leads. These are not necessarily leads that are ready to speak to your sales team, but they are leads that you can add to your database. I'll give you another example. Info USA, one of the most popular places to purchase leads. Here I can decide, do I want a list of leads for businesses, a list of leads for consumers? Let's take an example. I'm going into the business list. I can see, oh, I want new US businesses. I want doctors. I want nurses. We can go deeper to see if there's more specific lists, a list of people that had gone bankrupt, a list of Canadian businesses, dentists, maybe you're selling specialized software or specialized products that dentists want. Well, why go generate a list of leads of dentists if you can just go to Info USA and say, here, here's my money, give me the list, and then a couple of days you have the list. Instead, marketers spend a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of effort into things that produce leads very slowly. I'm going to give you another example. We do not just have to buy lists. We could also go about buying leads through content syndication. So I can go to a company, a content syndication company. This is just an example, pure B2B. And I can say, OK, I'm willing to pay this much per lead to get people to download my white paper about a problem that my target customer solved. So every time Pure B2B sends you leads, you pay them for those leads. So in effect, you are paying for leads through content syndication. I'll give you another example of why lead generation is very easy. You simply give away something for free. So maybe you're at a trade show and you decide, we're gonna give away a $100 Visa gift card if you show up to our booth, or we're gonna give you a free stay at a hotel, or we're gonna give you a free vacuum. We're gonna give you our product for a year. These are ways of getting leads, giving away something for free. What most people do is they give away something like an ebook or a white paper in exchange for contact information. They call that a lead. The other way to get more leads is to simply relax your definition of what constitutes a lead. So you loosen it and you say anyone for which we have an email address is considered a lead or anyone that volunteers their information is a lead. The more you relax the definition, the more your top of funnel leads numbers increase. Here's the thing though, lead generation, easy, fast, cost effective. You can pay tens of cents for lead. Here's the hard part. It's the lead nurturing. This is what's difficult. 
It's not generating the leads, it's the persuasion and the sales tactics that convince somebody not just to be a lead, but to talk to your sales team, in some cases, if you're selling an expensive product, or to buy your product. This is particularly true if you're selling a low price product. So it's the lead nurturing that's very difficult, and that's the part that most marketers miss, and that's the part where most marketers fail. When it comes to SaaS marketing, outbound absolutely crushes inbound. And I'm gonna tell you 10 reasons why that's the case. Number one, outbound marketing is cheap. A lot of people will probably try to convince you that inbound marketing is cheap. That's because all you need to do is create content. You write the content, the content generates traffic, the traffic generates customers. The problem here is nobody's actually quantifying the cost and comparing it to outbound, at least not very many people. The true cost is actually quite expensive. A blog post could cost $500, an ebook might cost $2,000 of internal labor to produce. There's the editing, there's the involvement of senior management to put input into all of these assets. So the cost gets very high. And the cost of outbound marketing is actually grossly overestimated because people are still thinking of outbound marketing in the traditional advertising sense where you're spending millions of dollars on TV ads. You don't need to do that anymore. I've run video advertising on Facebook that generated views for one cent each. I've run similar types of video advertising on LinkedIn for just four cents each. It's very, very cost effective to do outbound marketing if you do it appropriately. Also, consider email. Yes, there's some fixed cost in the beginning when you invest in a program like Lemlist or Mailshake. Yes, you have to set up some email sequences, but the marginal cost of delivery is virtually nothing. So outbound is very cost effective. The other key advantage with Outbound is that it's extremely fast. You can be up and running within minutes or more realistically, perhaps with feedback and input days to get approval from something like Facebook advertising. Now with inbound marketing, uh, often what you're doing is you're investing in assets, uh, content assets that may not generate ranking results until three months. So to be ROI positive, it may be not until the following year that you're actually generating serious results. So that's probably one of the single biggest reasons you should be doing outbound marketing is to get fast results. Number three, with outbound marketing, you can reach your entire TAN virtually, your entire total addressable market. You can identify the exact people, all the potential buyers for your product using something like LinkedIn Sales Navigator, Apollo, you could use list builders, there's all different ways you can get access to your TAM. And then what you can do is you can bombard everybody in your target market with messages. It's not really possible to do that with inbound. With inbound, you are severely limited by people that are actively looking for solutions. And if we take a general rule of thumb, 95% of business to business buyers are not actively looking for a solution. So you're severely limiting the amount of exposure that your SaaS product can have if you're relying solely or predominantly on inbound channels. Now, what I say with SaaS marketing, my general philosophy is you either go big or you go back to selling services. So if you wanna go big, if you wanna scale, which is what SaaS wants to do, it's what it lives for, uh, you really should be looking at outbound marketing. And I think the reason that a lot of SaaS companies, only a tiny uh, sliver actually get venture capital, but the vast majority don't, is because they're not thinking big enough. And when you start thinking in terms of outbound, what happens is you're immediately thinking of distribution and you're immediately thinking of how to access the entire market. Whereas with inbound, you don't often think of distribution first, you think of content first and then kind of hope that it, it generates the traffic and the distribution that you want. Um, now, the other key thing related to this total addressable market is that outbound channels are fundamentally more scalable. Email, advertising, direct mail, all of these can essentially be scaled to the size of your market. Inbound can't do that. So what ends up happening with inbound is you basically become addicted to cranking out more and more content. So the economies of scale that are supposed to be realized from investing in content assets often isn't. You just end up needing to produce more and more. With outbound, you don't need to do that. 
Yes, you need a, a few key critical pieces of content, such as a case study, uh, but you can scale that case study to as many people as you want at the, free, the reach and frequency that you want. Much, much more scalable. The other key advantage is that outbound is less risky. Inbound marketing is often kind of like gambling. Not always, but often it is. So what you're doing is you're investing a lot of time and resources into certain assets, and you're hoping they get distribution, you're hoping they get consumed, and yes, you have some control over that. You're optimizing for keywords, etc. but there's really no guarantees. Without Bound, you're pretty much guaranteed to reach your entire market. So the risk is minimized uh, in addition to time. So the the time with which you can reach those people and actually see uh, what the risk potential is, is much, much faster. The other key thing with Outbound is that it focuses you on the right metrics. So one of the challenges with Inbound is the time delays. There's a serious time delay between when you invest in content and when you're able to realize revenue or some sort of hard metrics from those content. With Outbound, because you're kind of force feeding content to the market uh, at a fast pace, at a controllable pace, uh, what you're able to do is optimize for the right metrics, metrics that are deeper down in the funnel, things like pipeline revenue. It's very, very hard to do that when you're doing inbound marketing. The other thing with Outbound is that it focuses you on what you do best. What you do best is uh, produce software software that can be scaled to numerous customers. The problem with inbound is what ends up happening is your company ends up focusing on journalism. So you're essentially converting yourself into a media company that is continually investing in content assets rather uh, than where I believe you should be focusing most of your time, which is investing in software assets and getting your economies of scale from the software rather than from the content marketing. So you're kind of splitting your strategic focus from software, which is the, the product-centric side, uh, to the media side, which is not the kind of business you wanna be in. It's a very competitive business uh, with lots of key influencers, entertainers, established journalistic entities. You don't wanna compete in that space. I suggest focusing on the product and using outbound marketing to drive demand quickly and effectively. Number eight. Outbound marketing gives you more control. Now, there are exceptions to this. If you consider Google advertising an inbound channel, which you can make a strong argument for that, yes, you have a lot of control. You can control the keywords, you can pause and edit things, uh, but generally speaking, inbound is far less controllable. With outbound, I can pause a campaign, I can edit campaigns, I can do that when I want, uh, to the extent that I want. I have way more control. The other thing that uh, transcends from this is that you can be more agile. So this is aligned very well with how startup SaaS companies are. There's an agile mindset. We don't really know what the market wants. Our positioning may be on clear in the beginning, but if we want run tests quickly, we're able to get market feedback and adjust accordingly. So for example, with outbound marketing, I could test uh, an entire sequence, which brings me to point number 10. Outbound marketing, more testable. Okay, I can test an entire marketing funnel with outbound marketing and optimize based on those funnels. Very, very difficult to do that with inbound. Often what inbound does is it forces you to test only ad hoc elements within marketing funnels. So things like the landing page. But uh, when we're thinking about big and scaling software to a large extent, Really, we need to think, be thinking more in terms of macro tests and less in terms of these nitty gritty A-B tests. So all of that said, a lot of SaaS companies fail with Outbound. And there are numerous reasons for this, but I just wanna highlight one of them. One of the key reasons is that their Outbound marketing campaigns are focused on the bottom of the funnel too much. All it is is trying to get people into a 15 minute conversation or a 30 minute meeting, trying to book the demo. That's not a very sophisticated way to approach outbound marketing. Outbound marketing, you need to think of the top of the funnel, the middle of the funnel, the bottom of the funnel. You need to think of nurturing flows. All of this can be automated. It can all be done cost effectively. No reason you shouldn't be doing that. Now, 
That said, I've listed 10 key reasons why I believe outbound marketing is generally better than inbound marketing. There are cases with some SaaS companies where inbound marketing is probably where you're gonna invest the majority of your marketing budget. What are those cases? Well, generally it's when you're selling a very tactical SaaS product, so it's not a strategic purchase, it's a non-strategic purchase, and where it's really only important at key trigger events. So there's some sort of event that happened with the buyer where they suddenly have a need for your product, they go and they search for it. So in cases like that, yes, inbound marketing is where you should be focusing because they're not gonna be very receptive to an outbound message for something that's not important to them except at those key junctures. You'd think that with billions of dollars pouring into SaaS companies that they'd be very greedy. But I can tell you from working in Silicon Valley for years and consulting for countless SaaS startups that they are not greedy enough. 95% of business to business buyers are not in market for your solution. But what do you see all these SaaS companies doing? They go on these spear phishing expeditions to capture that tiny 5% piece of the pie. And let me tell you, that is a blood bath. The real neurosis that is plaguing SaaS companies is not greed. It's these two things. Number one, short-term thinking. SaaS companies are still playing the game like it's going to be over in one to two quarters, even when those SaaS companies have been around for a decade or longer. The second neurosis, an obsession with quantitative attribution even though we know that the marketing that is gonna drive the biggest impact is not so easily measured at the granular level. At the end of the day, the only real sustainable competitive advantage that matters is economies of scale. And what does that mean? That means you need to go big or go home and acquire tons and tons of new customers. The question you need to keep asking yourself over and over so that you don't confuse the forest for the trees is what would 10x my business? Stop obsessing over these little 5% conversion lifts and start looking for big wins like giant exclusive partnerships with other software companies. Stop trying to capture demand and start trying to figure out how are we gonna actually create it. Stop doing things like building lists through gated white papers and start figuring out how do we broadcast our message to the entire total addressable market. Stop fighting over scraps and start figuring out how you can dominate markets. 15 ways to get SaaS demo requests and customers. One, pay prospects to attend your demo. You can offer them something like a $75 Amazon gift card as a special incentive. Two, LinkedIn lead gen forms rather than sending people to your landing page or homepage and message ads. In my experience, I can typically send message ads directly to customers' inboxes for just 40 cents, sometimes as low as 16 cents. Direct mail gift boxes. If you want to generate serious pipeline revenue this quarter from the mid-market or enterprise, consider it. Highlight the cost of not requesting a demo. People are inherently loss averse, so if you phrase things in this way, instead of what they gain, your performance may go up. You can use a simple two-step formula for a marketing funnel. You start with something focused on education, like a video where you maximize the number of video views, and then you retarget the people that watch the video to push them to a demo request. Six, promote demo requests at the bottom of every email, every white paper, every thank you page, and every single nurturing asset that you put out. Another trick if you're really trying to scale and get in front of large audiences is to work with the people that already have a lot of clout, 
that already have a lot of influence with your target customers, and you can find them using this free tool called SparkToro. Number eight, after they request a demo, you can provide them a link to a calendar for scheduling so that they actually end up showing up. Nine, continue marketing to prospects after they become marketing qualified leads. Highlight the benefits of the demo itself as an offer, as opposed to just talking about your software and the benefits of the software. One of the biggest ways you can generate a lot of demo requests is to partner with a company, another software company, that is much larger than you and has a much bigger user base. 12. Keep nurturing for months and months. It's easy to focus on the low-hanging fruit, but if you nurture, you're going to have a more cost-effective demo request generating machine. What you want to do is, as you're nurturing, you always give people the agency. You give them the option of requesting a demo. You want to meet customers where they're at, at their level of awareness. And the most simplistic way to think about this is based on four different levels. Their problem unaware. They don't know that they have a problem or they don't know that they have the problem that you solve. Their category unaware. They're not very familiar or educated on the types of products that you sell. Their product unaware. They're aware of the category, but they don't really know your specific brand. And then there are those that are product aware. So these are the low hanging fruit and the people that you may be able to convert to demo requests and uh, sales opportunities quickly. 14, identify and address objections. There are going to be objections at different phases in your funnel. Make sure you do some research to find out what they are so you can fill those leaky buckets. And finally, number 15, finish the rest of this course and please, Message me if you feel that there's anything missing. I'm going to talk about the different horizons and timeframes that we're working on with SaaS marketing. And this is going to dispel a lot of the confusion and a lot of the debates that are happening about things such as should we be focusing on brand awareness or should we just be focusing on demand generation? So in the short term, so this is when you're a bootstrap startup, you don't have a lot of funding and you don't even know if you're gonna be around in the next year or two, what you're really focused on is the short term. So in the short term, your sole focus pretty much is the income statement because you need revenue coming in, you need profit coming in just to sustain your own existence. Because if you can't pay the bills, then there's no point in investing in things that aren't going to pay dividends until five years, 10 years into the future. So this is where demand generation is the focus. And that's a, a problem for a lot of startup businesses is because they get excited about these great ideas like content marketing, brand building, uh, but in reality, if they don't have a lot of funding, they just can't afford to do it. They're really concerned with, can I get revenue in the next three months? So that's why demand generation is so important when you're a small business. And often what happens with early startups is they don't put enough weight on demand generation and the marketers that they hire don't have a sophisticated understanding of demand generation because they're used to running more brand campaign centric more holistic uh, approaches to marketing. All right, so another mistake that happens in the early stage is low risk tolerance. So people don't want to try things because they're scared their reputation's going to get ruined or they're, they're scared of uh, offending people or getting something wrong. But really, you have nothing to lose when you're small. You have no reputation. If you do something wrong, people are going to forget about you. They won't even remember uh, that you did something because they don't even know your brand. They don't know your company. So you should be taking uh, a high risk approach. You should be trying different things and you should have a lot of agility when you approach those. The, the other mistake that people make is they aren't focused on in-market customers. So in-market customers are those that are 
ready to buy. These are the people that are actively searching on Google searches saying, how do I buy a software that solves this problem? Or um, does it, or they're asking on Reddit and Quora, like, does anyone know if there's a solution for this? Uh, these are people that, you know, they have their, their wallets open, they're ready to make a purchase. Now, the measure of success in the short term is really return on investment. So this is I'm going to I'm going to put this much money into Google ads into Facebook ads into um, email automation software. How much money am I going to get out of it? OK, so it's really hard financial metrics like return on investment, short term thinking in terms of KPIs. So success often in the short term is really driven by a VP of demand generation. You don't actually have a head of marketing. You, you pretty much just have a head of demand generation. So feeding the pipeline of sales to the sales team. Now, this completely changes in the long term. And there's a, an inflection point. Some people like Jason Limp can say it's around 10 million ARR. Uh, kind of depends on what you're dealing with. Are you in enterprise sales or are you mid-market sales? Are you uh, direct to consumer? Then uh, that inflection point may be a little bit earlier. So here, what we're really focused on is the balance sheet. So if we think about investors like Bruce Greenwald, or Warren Buffett, when they value companies, they start by looking at the balance sheet and they say, okay, what is the value of the assets? Let's subtract the liabilities. And that's, that's the core value of the company. Now, on top of that, there's income coming in. That's great. There's also growth. That's great. But really the bulk is the book value. So it, it, it's the assets. Now, what are we concerned with here? It's less about demand generation. It's about asset management, right? You actually have assets now. You've been around for a while. You've built up equity. You have a brand that is worth protecting, that has a reputation that needs to be sustained. You've built up communities. You've built up proprietary content. Perhaps you've built up uh, an annual event. You own the event for your industry. So these are, these are assets that need to be managed. Whereas earlier, you really had no assets. You're starting out, it's just about income income coming in. Now you can take a portion of that and start investing it. But uh, in the short term, you aren't managing anything because you don't have anything. Now, a mistake that companies make is when they get large, they're still stuck in the mindset of demand generation. What is the pipeline coming in in the next two, three months, this quarter, this half year? But really, it, that's too short term thinking. Now you should be thinking in terms of large assets and thinking more in terms of a longer time horizon. The opposite problem happens with short-term companies. They, they get a little too excited about building the brand and they're not uh, looking at the income statement enough. So as you get larger, now you have a lower risk tolerance, right? People are more likely to sue you because you have money to lose. And if, if they sue, they'll actually get something. You also have a brand reputation that needs to be protected. Uh, the Workforce is larger now, so it becomes more politicized. So now you're getting more conservative in how you're approaching your marketing. You can't just do random agile experiments. You probably have a more solidified uh, strategy that you need to adhere to more strictly and in a more disciplined nature. So the other thing that you're doing is you're focusing more on out-of-market customers. So instead of only focusing on those that have high purchase intent that are actively searching for a solution, now you're going after not just the early adopters, but also people where, okay, maybe they don't have a need right now, but with enough brand reputation sustained in the market, they will come to you as the default solution when that need arises, or because you're so popular, they're, they're actually thinking, hey, maybe this is something that would help us even though I don't have a, a red hot pain that, to address right now. So instead of return on investment, what you're really thinking of is in terms of equity. Am I building the value of the company? Am I building the value of the brand? And am I gonna get a return on asset? Uh, 
when I make these investments and, and, and grow the assets that we already have. You're, you're thinking in terms of uh, things like brand awareness, you're thinking in terms of access share of boy. So your, your KPIs start to shift. Now in business to business, not enough people make this transition. They're still stuck in the short term thinking. And that's why they grow very slowly and marginally because they're, they're being very safe and uh, protective. Now, uh, the other thing that we see is that as you start to approach this, you know, tens of millions in revenue as a SaaS company, now you start to think in terms of we need a chief marketing officer. We need somebody to manage the the, uh, the new roles that are emerging at this stage, which is product marketing managers, brand marketing managers, people more dedicated to content. So people that are more oriented around managing assets rather than just generating short-term uh, advertising revenue, short-term marketing communications revenue. So that is; these are the major two stages that you're dealing with. Now, uh, I, I actually think the secret magic happens in the middle. And in the middle, what you're doing is you're not 100% focused on the income statement, but you're also not 100% focused on the balance sheet. You're focused on things that are kind of midterm investments. And this is something that I, I'm, I, I'm hugely biased towards. This is the midterm. So these are things like large contracts, partnerships. So partnerships take different forms. It may be an exclusive contract that you have with um, whatever the core piece of software is in your industry. So that might be a practice management system. It might be the ERP. It might be the accounting system. It might be the CRM. Usually SaaS exists in these ecosystems and at the, the nexus of that ecosystem is one of these major pieces of software. So ideally, you want to get a partnership with who, whatever that main piece of software is. Now, that's not the only partnership you could have. You can have partnerships with companies that are the same size as you. You can do things like co-marketing or you could do an annual research report with uh, that company. Uh, you can also work with smaller a partner, so influencers, web designers, accountants, lawyers, people that have a lot of clout with your, your target customers. Partnerships can also be with large social media people that influence your target customers. So these are things where, okay, you may not get results in three months, but you're probably gonna get them this year or maybe after six months of investing time in it. So you're concerned with investments, kind of midterm investments. Uh, the other thing you can start looking at is virality. So things that don't necessarily have a linear payoff like Google pay-per-click ads, but a, a viral video or a, a sharing program, an affiliate program, things that can generate exponential returns. They may not necessarily because you're gonna need to experiment, but it could have a higher payoff than those kind of surefire ROI campaigns. Okay, so we looked at the short term, the long term, and then my, my favorite space, which is this midterm. And there's another area, which is the far future. Now, the far future is generally not something you're looking at unless you have tons of venture capital or you're a large established company that's been around for a while. So this is where thought leadership becomes more important. Now, a lot of marketers get a little too focused on thought leadership way too early. And I think this is because uh, companies like HubSpot tell you inbound marketing is the answer to everything. The problem with inbound marketing is that it takes tons of time to build momentum with um, things like content, large pieces of content, large pieces of thought leadership. And don't get me wrong, I use HubSpot, I love HubSpot. I think customer support is, um, Amazing, very exceptional, uh, but uh, you shouldn't be too biased towards thought leadership because often it's oriented towards that far future stage. And unless you're dealing with um, some pieces of content, which are more kind of midterm, long-term focused, like a, a maybe proprietary research report or a, a webinar, um, SEO focused content. 
Okay, so in the far future, we're also concerned with research and development. We're concerned with projects that shoot for the moon, things that could 100x the business, um, but we're not sure because there's a lot, there are a lot of unknowns when you're dealing with the far future. The other thing that you're looking at is emerging technology and emerging markets. So things that are on the periphery that could be highly profitable, but there is a lot of uncertainty there and it does require some investment um, now uh, in order to reap those profits in the future. But if you're a small company, you don't have a lot of funding, you just can't afford to operate in this space at all. If you want to grow your business to business SaaS company very quickly, this is the video for you. There's a trend that we're seeing right now in business to business marketing. What it is, is business to business marketers are starting to think more like consumer marketers. For example, when we look at the LinkedIn's think tank, the B2B Institute, one of the biggest things that they advocate is very creative brand marketing. Now, I think if you're a large business to business company, that's great. Investing in brand marketing is an excellent long-term play. But for most SaaS companies that are under 10 million in annual revenue, it's probably not the best approach because it's too slow and too time consuming. But there are aspects of consumer marketing that I think you can advocate, and these are ones that are gonna generate results very quickly. And we're gonna learn about these by looking at the luxury brand, Lacoste. Now, Lacoste is a French company, but its largest market is actually the United States. How did that happen? How did a French company come to dominate the US market so the first key to their success was partnerships. They partnered with Izon, a company, a brand that already had a strong presence in the United States. The other thing that they did was they formed partnerships with companies like National Geographic and Supreme in more modern times, both of which helped secure their presence in various different markets. Now, the equivalent to this in the SaaS market is when you partner with companies for things like co-branded webinars. You can do this with other software companies. You can do it with other companies that sell products to the same target customers as you do. The other thing that you can do, and this is something that Jason Lemkin of Sasta recommends, is partner with your competitors. Establish integrations with your competitors. Do co-marketing and co-event marketing with your competitors. So partnerships was one of the keys to Lacoste's success. The second is a different type of partnership, which is with key influencers. Now in the early days when Lacoste was first establishing itself in the US, what it did was it gave away products to key influencers like John F. Kennedy, Bing Crosby, and President Eisenhower. Today what they're doing is they partner with people like famous tennis players. This is one of the most efficient ways to acquire customers. Why? Because it's more efficient to go through an intermediary who has an influence, has a following, has trust and credibility, than it is to build up from scratch directly with your end buyers. So partnering with influencers is probably one of the most underrated B2B strategies. One of the easiest tools to do it is to use a tool called SparkToro, in which you can identify which influencers have the strongest credibility within your target customer group, and how to quantify the clout that they have. A third thing that Lacoste has done effectively is latch on to a feel-good message. For example, they have had shirts go out with endangered species replacing the Lacoste logo. So this type of marketing, it's very creative. It's not direct response marketing. You cannot measure the immediate success of sales when you do something like creative advertisement like that or creative campaign. But what happens is you generate virality, you generate PR, you generate word of mouth. And these types of marketing are much, much more cost effective and generate it much more explosive growth than the standard direct response marketing where you're trying to attribute everything to revenue, attribute everything to lead generation. So typically what I see with SaaS companies is they invest in marketing that generates very slow results. Usually this is inbound content marketing. A marketing engine that works, but
but that takes a lot of time over a year often to generate a positive return on investment. What we can learn from Lacoste and other consumer brands is that you can grow extremely quickly by investing in partnerships and by investing in key influencers. I've worked with tons of SaaS companies and there is this one issue that I keep running into when I look at their data. And what it is, is the marketing departments get incredibly efficient at doing one thing and that is generating MQLs, marketing qualified leads. So these are typically defined as demo requests or sometimes it's a free trial sign up or other times companies will have some sort of scoring system where users who engage with certain pieces of content or a certain number of pieces of content will suddenly be promoted to MQL status. So these companies are spending a lot of money. They're working with agencies. They're running pay-per-click ads. They're running Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads. They're doing all sorts of campaigns that are incredibly efficient at driving down the cost of the MQL. So they might generate demo requests for, I don't know, say like $30. But the problem is that there's this giant chasm between MQL and SQL. So between marketing qualified lead and a sales qualified lead. So what ends up happening is a number of different problems. One of the main ones is that people will sign up for a demo, which would suggest high buying intent. It would suggest somebody that should be a sales qualified lead. But what ends up happening is they don't actually show up to the demo. Other people will request a demo and the sales team may not get back to that person until several days later, depending on what time zone they're in. And even when they do, the person just does not respond to the email. They don't answer the phone call. Perhaps they provide it an incorrect phone call. So this is really a symptom that marketing is optimizing for the wrong thing, which is not marketing qualified leads. It's really sales qualified leads or sales qualified opportunities. That's really what you need to be optimizing for. Because if you're simply increasing marketing qualified leads, you're basically optimizing your campaigns for a vanity metric. And what ends up happening is if you focus on the sales qualified leads, that actually means that you need fewer marketing qualified leads and a lower budget to produce the same output, to get the same number of customers. So what you really should be doing is marketing to people after they become a sales qualified, or sorry, excuse me, a marketing qualified lead. What marketing departments often do is they say, all right, I generated a bunch of demo requests or free trial signups. Okay, sales can deal with them now. And they say, mission accomplished, job done. It was very cost effective. Your CAC is going to go through the roof if you treat your marketing that way because you have not done your job if all you've done is generate a demo request. You need to send reminder emails so people actually show up to the demo. You need to remind people of what the value is of your software. And you can't make a lot of assumptions about awareness. So some people assume that because somebody requested a demo that they are highly familiar with your product, they are familiar with your brand, they will remember what you do after they request the demo, they will actually schedule the demo. There are all kinds of fixes that you need to work on after the MQL stage to get people to actually talk to the sales rep. Because if you optimize for MQLs, there's no guarantee that there's actually been a successful handoff to the sales team. That's really the key metric that you need to smooth out. Now, here's the great news, though. Working on that giant gap between MQL and SQL often doesn't cost anything. It means automated emails. It could mean phone bots. It could mean chat bots. It can mean simply taking a portion of your advertising budget and allocating it to retargeting people that have already become demo requests. And what you're going to find is the overall marketing system gets much more efficient at acquiring customers at a lower price. So what does this actually look at look like when we look through the data? Well, I'm going to show you right now in the next video. Okay, so we're going to go through the data to see how to diagnose this problem. 
Typically with SaaS companies, there is some sort of issue in the middle of the funnel that can be fixed without a lot of money. You might need to invest in a little bit of automation software. You need to invest time in copywriting. You need to invest time in talking to sales and other people in marketing, but you don't need a lot of budget to drive top, the top of the funnel. Uh, you can improve performance significantly just by fixing the funnel itself. Here are some benchmarks from Forrester. Now, what we can see here is the conversion rates from uh, marketing qualified leads to sales qualified leads to pipeline. So pipeline is the potential revenue associated with sales qualified opportunities. Now, depending on how sophisticated your SaaS company is, you may not know what that means. So basically opportunities are potentials to win a contract. These are people that may be considering buying your product, buying your competitor's product, and typically they would be assigned to potential revenue. If you project that they'll probably make a purchase decision in the next three months, maybe six months, if you're selling a large enterprise and you're dealing with a long sales cycle. Often companies don't have a funnel that's this detailed. And in fact, there are funnels that are more detailed than this. So instead of before MQL, you might have marketing engage leads and before marketing engage leads, you could have marketing captured leads. Uh, but this is sort of a, a standard business to business funnel that you'd be operating under. So what we can see here is that the typical conversion rate and your situation may be different. Maybe you're dealing with uh, very small companies or very large companies. So the data are going to be a little bit different, but basically it's about a third. So about a third of people you expect to go through each stage. Now for some companies, SQL and pipeline are effectively the same thing. So if you're, if you get in touch with the contact and you're pretty much selling them, most of the time when you get them on the phone, then you can pretty much say, okay, SQL pipeline are the same thing. But typically what happens is there is a huge drop off here where you might have hundreds of MQLs and you know just a handful of SQLs. And that's just indicative of not having a proper handoff to the sales team. Sometimes what you see is that the win rate is too high and often what the win rate of the, uh, the pipeline is too high. What that would suggest is you have too strict a definition of what constitutes pipeline or what constitutes an opportunity. Uh, often this happens because people use BANT as the criteria for determining what a sales qualified opportunity is. That's not really that great because what it's if your your close rate on opportunities is eighty plus percent, then you're you're not really looking at opportunities. You're really just looking at customers and why track customers and pipeline at the same time. So sometimes what you need to do is loosen the definition of what constitutes opportunities by extending the time frame or. Um, loosening some of the other criteria that you use for opportunities. So let's take a look at how this typically plays out in a spreadsheet. Now, <clears throat> often what I see is companies, typically the COO, the CFO, sometimes the head of marketing or the head of demand generation will have a spreadsheet. And it'll look something like this. Uh, original lead source. And then they'll track MQL. SQL, SQO, so these are the opportunities, and then the customers. And then what they might track, if they're a little more sophisticated, would be the CAC. So you'll have some different channels. You'll have paid search. Uh, you might have paid social ads, um, maybe like programmatic. You may have uh, organic search and you might have partnerships, customer referrals. 
So whatever lead source buckets you're using in Salesforce and HubSpot and Zoho, whatever system you're using, you can just put them into a spreadsheet like this. You may already be doing this. You may have this automated in your CRM already with a reporting dashboard. That's great. Now, often what may happen is you generate something like, well, let, let, let's categorize this. Let's say that this is for the month of January. Okay, so let's say you generated 100 MQLs. So these are demo requests in this case. And SQL I'm gonna define as a conversation with sales. Okay, so you generate 100 demo requests. Maybe they cost, say, $50 to generate a demo request. But then you only get 10 SQLs. And then out of those, let's say five become SQOs, and then three become customers. So the problem here is the conversion from MQL to SQL is only 10%. And if we use benchmarks, which granted are not perfect and are gonna vary by case, that conversion rate should be about one third. And instead we're getting one in 10. So this is a problem. What's happening is sales is generating tons of demo requests. They're probably doing it cost effectively too. They, they might be even getting it for under 50 bucks. They might be doing it for $10, but it doesn't really matter if your SQL cost is through the roof. So what you need to look at is why are these people requesting demos not actually having conversations with sales? Why are they not replying to the emails? Why are they not showing up even though they scheduled demos? Maybe they're not even scheduling demos. Maybe you need a Calendly link to make sure it gets on the calendar. Maybe when somebody requests a demo on the website, they need to be brought to a calendar immediately. And if they are doing that, maybe you just need more nurturing emails that A, remind them to show up for the demo and B, reinforce what your product does and the benefits of showing up to the demo. I think there are a lot of assumptions when people become an MQL. Assumptions about the level of awareness, the level of memory, and the level of intent. If somebody is browsing through Facebook, browsing through LinkedIn, and they request a demo, you cannot assume that they're gonna remember your brand name and often that's the first conversation that they're going to get from the account executive. Hey, I'm Joe from X brand. When are you available for a demo? And there's so many issues with that kind of follow-up email. One, uh, why is the onus on the prospect to provide a time to do the demo? The best option would be get prompt them to schedule it automatically through the website. If they don't do that, then have a link in the email that allows them to book through Calendly or HubSpot or whatever. And if they don't do that, propose sometimes. Okay, how is Tuesday afternoon Eastern or uh, Wednesday morning Pacific? And if they don't do that, then there's the option for them to reply to suggest times. So that could be one of the issues that's happening in this poor conversion rate. There are lots of other things that could be happening too. One is just not doing proper nurturing. So the fact that they requested a demo could suggest that they're actually requesting demos from competitors as well. So if you request demos from three different suppliers for, let's say your SaaS product is an online chat, you may not remember which one you talked to. You may already be on the phone with a one of the providers. So you need to look at things like response time. Did you respond to that lead within five minutes? Did you respond to them within five days? And did your email even go through? Is there a deliverability issue? There are tons and tons of problems that happen with the conversion from MQL to SQL. And typically what I recommend to SaaS companies is before they start looking at top of funnel marketing and scaling their marketing, they need to start fixing these leaky buckets. Now, let's say this number was higher. Um, so for example, in partnerships, let's say it's 100 and we're getting 40 SQLs. 
this is good. 40% of the demo requests are actually ending up having conversations with sales, but let's say that we're only getting five opportunities here. So that suggests that there's a different issue in the funnel. The conversion from SQL to SQO is the issue. So you're not actually getting people that have urgent buying intent. So what that may mean is that you're, you need to change who your partnerships are with. Uh, perhaps you need to align yourself with partners that are more involved with customers at key junctures where they need to make purchases. So examples of that is if somebody has built a new website, maybe it's an e-commerce website, that is a critical time when they may need to invest in a lot of different SaaS products, right? They're going to need the online chat. They're going to need automated integrations. They're going to need uh, e-commerce applications. They may need heat map data. They're going to need analytics data. So a lot of that happens at that trigger point, which is creating a new website. And there are certain partners that have disproportionate power during that period web designers and web developers, and also the, uh, the backend programmers that are involved with the, uh, the ERPs and whatnot. So you can see that by looking at key issues along the funnel, you can start to hone in on where the marketing gaps are. Now, sometimes where the issue is, is the conversion from SQO to customers. Uh, maybe it's only 10%, 20%, something like that. What that suggests is that you may have a, an informalized sales process that needs to be formalized. It may mean that you need to bring in a temporary sales consultant, or it may mean that your product, your product marketing manager needs to spend more time on sales enablement. So you can look at things like, why did you lose opportunities? Are you losing them to competitors? Are you losing them because of price? So if price is the issue, then it's not really a sales problem. It's a, a fundamental issue with the, the, the pricing structure. Um, it, it could also just be a fundamental misunderstanding, a strategic misunderstanding of what you're selling. A lot of SaaS companies make this high level marketing strategy mistake. And one of those mistakes is the assumption that they're selling a strategic purchase. So a strategic purchase is when the product that you're selling helps your customer differentiate their product to their customers. But a lot of the time, SaaS products are not strategic purchases. They just fix little operational issues that have nothing to do with differentiating their offerings. So online chat would be an example. Um, certain things dealing with uh, accounting or with the flow of invoices or email communications. These are not strategic purchases. So trying to charge a premium price for those kinds of products is a high level failed mistake because it's very hard to charge a premium price when you are selling a non-strategic purchase. So if that's where things are falling apart at the SQO to customer stage, you should be looking at the lost reasons. Uh, price uh, is one of those, but it could also just be um, issues with the sales team. So you, you should be listening to phone calls that sales are having with prospects. Um, is it appropriate? Is it aligned with the strategy, the marketing strategy and the sales strategy? And there should be cross-departmental collaboration. So if you're seeing issues across every stage and the conversion is very poor, it could indicate that there's just not enough collaboration between departments. So it may mean weekly meetings between marketing and sales and uh, maybe bi-weekly meetings with the CEO or the heads of the department, something like that. It could also mean that your top of funnel targeting is very poor. Um, so for example, Facebook, uh, often requires targeting based on lookalikes and lookalikes are far less out of your control than something that may have much more precise, efficient targeting like LinkedIn. So creating a spreadsheet like this is going to help you diagnose problems and fix errors that are going to occur at different stages in the funnel, which are going to vary by company. But again, I would say one of the biggest issues is MQL to SQL. Some of you may be familiar with Moz.com used to be known as SEO Moz. 
This is one of the leaders in the search engine optimization space. Now, the founder of this company has started a new business that I am always endorsing. I am not an affiliate of this website in any way. I just love it because it's something I've been looking for forever. Now, to give you some background, there used to be this website called Clout. And what Clout did was it enabled you to look at the market and see how much clout or authority certain people had. So uh, people that had certain followings, they had an on, a lot of influence through certain channels, but that doesn't exist anymore. But what has come to replace it is something that's even better. And that is Sparktaro.com. So Sparktaro, it's free uh, to a certain extent. I think you get something like 10 searches per month and those search you can keep redoing the same searches so uh, the capacity is very generous and what it does is it enables you to figure out who the key influencers are that carry a lot of clout with your target customers it enables you to identify which media sources your target customers are using and to just generally put together what i would call an influencer marketing plan uh, it also kind of bridges into the space of PR. So let's take a look at how this would work. So the first thing is you want to create an account. So do that. I've already done it. And then you have to define your audience. So there are different ways to do this. You can define it in terms of what words they use in their profile, what social accounts they follow, websites that they visit, and uh, frequently use hashtags that they have. Typically, I use uses these words in their profile. So, for example, let's say that the target audience was medical doctors. Well, I might put MD here, or I might put physician, surgeon, something like that. So let, let, let's just try physician and see what happens. Okay, so it's doing the search, calculating the audience size. And we're getting some interesting data. So we start to see, okay, here are some of the social accounts that physicians follow. Here's the websites, hidden gems, which are uh, perhaps a good starting point. Now, when you reach out to influencers, it's going to be hard to get those tier one people that are constantly being solicited. But the hidden gems might be an easier beachhead for you if you're just starting with influencer marketing and PR. Uh, same thing, hidden gems for websites. So websites were maybe easier to get like a guest blog post. It's probably going to be harder uh, with these hardcore ones. Podcasts. So you can be a guest speaker on a podcast. You can have your CEO guest speak on a podcast. Uh, that's going to be much easier than building up your own podcast from scratch. Um, that's something that a lot of people say. You should start your own podcast, start your own publication. But not all of us are journalists and not all of us have the time to build up a massive following. It's much easier to just borrow a following that already exists. Similar course of action with YouTube channels. And then there are press accounts where you might want to work with a PR agent or something. So we're looking at physicians as the target audience. We can get some insights about the audience, so the size. Um, certain hashtags that they're using. So all this is very interesting. But where it really starts to get exciting is here. Look at the social accounts. So uh, these are the social accounts that they're following. So this guy is a surgeon who's an influencer. Let's take a closer look at him. All right, so SparkTaro gives him a score. You can see that most of his following is coming from Twitter. So one way you could use this is you could reach out to this person and say, hey, um, we'd like to pay you to do a demo of our product. So you give this, this man $100, $75 to sit through a demo of your product to get his feedback. And once you kind of have some rapport with this person, then you can start to talk to him about, hey, um, you know, maybe we're interested in paying you to talk about our product through a tweet. Right. He has a lot of cloud on Twitter. He also has some cloud on Facebook. So maybe uh, you want to do a Facebook live with this person where he's showing your product. Now, the way you reach out to influencers, it's not always explicitly sales oriented. It's not necessarily just talking about your product and paying them to promote your product. It might also be something that's a softer approach to marketing. It's, hey, are you interested in doing a joint webinar where we talk about solving a problem? that the audience has. 
and uh, perhaps your product sponsors that content. So th there's kind of a spectrum of ways to work with these people, ranging from uh, high level content marketing, which is probably more appropriate for larger companies or companies that have a lot more funding to uh, more bottom of funnel things like product oriented webinars, sponsored demos, things like that. Okay, so let's take a look at um, some of these other influencers. Now you can see that some of them are brand names. Not all influencers are individuals. So influencers are often associations, Sometimes they're individual, sometimes it's a brand or a brand that's associated with an individual. Uh, it really depends. But let, let's take a look at this other individual and we can see, okay, he has a, a pretty strong following on Twitter and Facebook, pretty minor following on Instagram. Uh, but this gives you some good ideas of how to reach the medical market through influencers. So this is the social category, but of course websites, which is a more conventional approach, to get things like guest uh, blog posts. Um, you can look at some of these. Now, Medscape, it's probably gonna be pretty hard to get on there. So you might wanna kind of start um, towards the bottom here and here, you, you need to upgrade your account to see it, um, but, but that's fine. I mean, try it out, try out the free account, see if you get any traction and if it's worthwhile and you wanna invest heavily in the space, then you can upgrade. Podcasts, I think is a great way to get started here. You can reach out to any one of these podcasts and say, hey, we want to be a guest on your uh, show. And we have an expert who's probably the CEO of your company, who's an authority on some topic, and just offer to show up on their podcast. Now, sometimes uh, it may be pay to play. So you need to pay to have your podcast or uh, to have your podcast published with them, or it may just be a sponsorship. Uh, which uh, I'm not a huge fan of sponsorships when it's just kind of um, the bulk of the content has nothing to do with your product or nothing to do with the problem that your product solves. Instead, it's just, hey, this is brought to you by brand name. Don't recommend that because it's the audience will just filter it out as an ad. Uh, it may work for some people. It hasn't worked for me. YouTube, you can see uh, the most popular channels. Now, obviously, Mayo Clinic is probably not going to endorse your product, particularly if you're a startup, but if you're more established and you have a credible brand, um, it may be worth reaching out. Now press, we can see, okay, so these physicians, they follow the World Health Organization, New York Times, CNN, Harvard Health. So a lot of big brand names, it's going to be a little harder to break in there. So when you're going after more niche markets, like smaller groups of people, what you're going to find is it gets easier. You're going to be looking at more niche publications, uh, podcasts that don't have huge followings. It's probably going to be easier to get um, guest positions on these. So SparkToro is an excellent tool as an entry point into marketing that I would say has large economies of scale. So there is this bias in marketing that has been promoted by companies such as HubSpot. And again, I have nothing against HubSpot. It's a great tool. I use it, I have tremendous support. But the this idea that inbound marketing and content marketing is everything, it leads people in the wrong direction because it it makes marketers and SaaS marketers in particular think they need to be publishers. They need massive amounts of blog posts. They need these engaging eBooks. They need long research reports. The problem with that approach is you probably do not have a large audience. You are not journalists. You are not newspaper writers, but there are people out there, these influencers, these podcasters, these bloggers who already have the audience. So it's much better to think about distribution. Okay, creating content is one thing, but actually getting in front of people is another. And the easiest way to do that is through key influencers. And the easiest way to find key influencers is using SparkTar. Now, what you might find is that a lot of the influencers that you're looking for aren't on here. And one thing that we know when we look at research from the University of Pennsylvania with Jonah Berger, who's a one of the, the biggest names in the marketing space because he, he wrote the book Contagious. He has another book about how to change people's minds called The Catalyst. And what we know from him and from other research is that most word of mouth is offline. And 
that makes it a challenge when you're finding key influencers because it's very difficult to track offline word of mouth conversations. So then you're going to be looking at things like uh, other tools. So meetup.com, where people that organize physical events, uh, you're going to be looking at association presidents that host events and weekly meetings. A lot of the word of mouth engagements are going to happen there. Now, the other thing that you can do is you can manually look for influencers. So you can go to amazon.com and see who's writing about your topic. So for example, let's say that your, um, your SAS has something to do with vegan nutrition or something. Well, you can, you can see who's writing books on this topic. That could be an influencer. You can go to udemy.com and see who is publishing courses that your target customers are interested in. You can go to YouTube, see who is publishing videos. You can go to Google. So I would say SparkToro is the easiest, fastest way to get started, but there's also an element of manual research that you could be doing, especially if you want to invest more of the space, which I highly recommend. I'm going to take some time to talk about SaaS branding because it's something that does not get enough attention. Most people in the SaaS marketing world essentially equate marketing with short-term lead generation or demand generation. But as your SaaS company starts to be more successful and more ambitious, you have to spend a lot more time thinking about branding and brand marketing. And there are a few critical distinctions that you need to draw when you start to move into the big leagues. The first is that there is a fundamental difference between the brand and the product. These are two different assets. There are two different ingredients in the marketing mix. And this is one of the critical reasons why I no longer use the four P's as a marketing mix model, because there's not a strong enough differentiation between how the brand as an asset creates value versus how the product creates value. Now, an example in the SaaS world is ClickUp. ClickUp has done an excellent job of brand marketing and of brand design. So we can see here, for example, their logo has this very colorful kind of rainbow-esque gradient style, very memorable. The name, I recall it quite strongly. You have the CEO who has this very distinctive image of having very colorful shirts. You see the logo on the laptop. You see the color in his chair. So there's a very strong brand identity here that's easy to recall. But just because I know the name ClickUp and I remember it and I like it because it's so colorful and fun and I like the CEO because he's always smiling, doesn't mean I know what the heck the product is. So there's the brand click up and then there's the product click up, which is a fundamentally different idea. The product creates value in very functional ways uh, based on use cases. Personally, I don't really know what those use cases are. I know the click up brand. I think they've done an excellent job raising brand awareness, but I have very little product knowledge. So as you start to move into brand marketing in the SaaS space, you need to think about how the brand creates value and also how the product creates value that is fundamentally different. Now, to highlight the importance of brand, I'm going to use this quotation from Jason Lemkin, the founder of Saster. Is HubSpot the best CRM for SMBs? You know what? It doesn't matter. It truly does not matter for 80% of customers. So this comes from a video uh, that Jason Lemkin did on the 10 ways to build a moat in SaaS. Uh, one of the critical ones being related to the brand. Basically, the point he's making is that your product can be fundamentally better than your competitors, but it doesn't really matter if your competitor wins on brand. Because customers, ultimately, they want to go with the default choice. They want to go with a brand they recognize because people like things they're familiar with. And things that are familiar feel safer. They feel like a more conservative choice. Feels like something you're going to be less blamed for. Uh, it seems less risky. So for 80% of customers, they don't actually care if HubSpot is a better CRM. It's just a recognized name, and that's what they're going to go with. It's a recognized brand. And that's the default choice that you want to become in the SaaS space. Now, the other thing that I want to highlight is that you need to think about branding versus brand marketing. So companies of all sizes at all stages have to do some sort of rudimentary branding. 
you need a logo, a name, you need something that identifies you and separates you from other suppliers out there. But what really gives the brand vitality is the brand marketing. So this is where you actually need to take budget and start doing things like I've done here, creating a brand awareness campaign in Facebook, for example, where I'm measuring things like what is the lift in the ad recall? Or I can do a video views campaign in LinkedIn Campaign Manager, which I've done here, optimizing a campaign not for direct response marketing, not for lead gen, not for the number of white paper downloads, but purely how many people actually watched a video where I'm promoting the SaaS brand. So you need to think about not just what is the brand strategy, what are the brand tactics, but also what kind of budget are we actually going to put behind it so that there's actually equity in the brand the equity uh, being tied to how familiar people are with your brand. So another quote from Jason Lemkin, investing heavily in brand past, past 5 million to 6 million in ARR and go long. So he's, he's talking about building a moat for your SaaS company, which depends a lot on the brand marketing. The other thing is often when we're talking about awareness, there's a stigma associated with it. Like, why would we invest in brand awareness? It doesn't generate revenue. Uh, but that's something that you do need to do in the long term. You do need to build that long term brand recognition. But there is other types of awareness that isn't just about the brand. So for example, there's problem awareness. Are people even aware that the problem that you solve is worth selling? There's category awareness. Are people even familiar with the product category that you're participating in? There's product awareness. So not only are people familiar with your brand name, like ClickUp, but are they actually familiar with your product, its use cases, its functionality? And then once they're product aware, you need to think about raising awareness of things like special offers that you have, sales discounts. So we need to differentiate between different types of awareness and recognize that awareness marketing is much more sophisticated and more granular than simply raising awareness of the brand. It's raising different levels of education at different stages. When you're a medium or large SaaS company, typically you got there because you focused a lot on demand generation or performance marketing. So there's a tendency to think that what got you to that stage is what's going to get you to the next stage. But the reality, based on tons and tons of research, is that once you're a medium-large company, you need to start dedicating money to raising uh, your brand and your brand equity. Now, I want to turn to the finance space to kind of explain why this is happening. So if we look at value investors, people like Bruce Greenwald, the Columbia Business School, people like Warren Buffett, the way that they fundamentally value companies, first and foremost, is by looking at the assets, so the book value of the company. And then they start looking at the revenue, and then they look at the potential for growth. But the bulk of the value actually comes from the assets. And when we think about what a brand is, that's what it is. It's a balance sheet asset. We're no longer just thinking about short-term revenue and sales. We're thinking about long-term equity building. And that's what you're doing when you're doing brand marketing. And that's why there needs to be a fundamental shift in the psychology of SaaS marketing uh, in sort of those mid-stages. So when we're looking at small companies, what are small companies focused on? And rightly so, it's revenue management. What is the sales pipeline coming in? What is the revenue coming in? Are we acquiring new customers quickly? So the fixation is with the income statement, which is very much focused on the short term. We're thinking about performance marketing or demand generation, depending on whether you're in the B2C or business to business space. And then when you're a large company, there's a shift in mindset that's happening. It's no longer just about short-term revenue. Now we're thinking in terms of asset management. We're thinking in terms of reputation management. We're thinking uh, less in terms of taking big, bold risks and more in terms of how do we protect what we have and extract more value out of it. So we're focused more on the balance sheet, more on assets, more on things like brand. And therefore, we need to think more about brand marketing and we need to think about more about other assets and own channels. So things like, do we have an annual event that we host that we can extract more value out of, out of to drive more long-term growth instead of just short-term revenue and cash? The other critical thing, if we look at the, the research that was synthesized by the B2B Institute based on tons and tons of uh, 
economic data coming out of Britain was that brand marketing is how you hit the 95% of business to bu business buyers who are out of market. So a lot of these business to business SaaS companies are very much fixated on the tiny group of people, the 5% that are actually in market actively looking for a solution. So this is why there's a fixation with account-based marketing and particularly account-based marketing that's driven by intent data. But what we're interested in in brand marketing is driving much bigger impact by hitting the other 95%, including the 5%, but uh, with a skew towards the 95%. So the key with brand building is to be memorable because what we're focused on is long-term impact. And long-term impact requires that you embed yourselves into the memory, into the psyche of the prospects that will be buying your product in the future. So how do you be memorable? Number one is you want to be bold and distinctive. You don't want to look like every other brand supplier in your competitive space. Now, this is very easy in business to business. Why? Because not a lot of business to business marketers or companies, SaaS companies, are bold enough to take any sort of uh, risk with their design. The other key is to be consistent. When things are consistent, they're more memorable. That's why you need things like a brand guy that says, this is the tone of voice that we're using in our SaaS language. This is the color tones that we're going to be using and applying consistently throughout all channels. And the reason for consistency is you're trying to build memorability. Memorability is uh, your, your end objective by doing all of this. You also want to be repetitive. So that means that your advertising, for example, is not just focused on are we getting people to supply emails to download white papers, which is kind of a um, very short term thinking, but we're thinking more in terms of, okay, what is the frequency? Are we hitting our total addressable market with one video view per, per week for 52 weeks so that when their buying need arises next year or in six months that, uh, okay, the repetition has embedded, has allowed our brand to embed itself into people's memories. The other thing is there's a skew towards more emotional types of marketing when you're doing brand marketing because emotions tend to be more associated with uh, memory and long-term memory. Now, th that's another key distinction you need to think about is when we think about positioning, positioning is often driven by the product marketing managers. And we're very much thinking about how the product is positioned. And often the best way that you position a product is around a use case, which is often a very functional use case, a very concrete use case. But when we're talking about brand positioning, which is the more classic definition of positioning, often that centers more on things like emotions. The reason being that you're trying to drive memorability. Now, if we look at Salesforce as an example of a company that has taken a little bit of boldness with their branding, uh, you notice that they use a lot of these mascot type characters, things like bears and people in costumes and animals in the forest. Uh, it's more memorable than just being a, a globe or some sort of technical wires or something like that. Going with something a little sillier, a little more consumer-esque is going to build a stronger brand even in the business to business enterprise space. Now, if we look at the recommendations from the B2B Institute, essentially the number one goal of brand marketing is to be famous. And if we think about what Jason Lemkin says specifically in the SaaS space is you want to become the default choice. So this isn't just about brand awareness. Brand awareness is a meaningful metric to track, but really you want to be famous. You want, whenever there is a buying decision that comes up, you, you're just immediately recalled without any, without much cognition required at all. And to become famous, there are critical changes that you need to make, such as I showed earlier, doing things like coming up with mascots, something that not a lot of business to business SaaS companies are going to do. Another thing that I recommend is that you drive word of mouth by working with influencers. Now, by influencers, I don't just mean people that are on Instagram taking photos with celebrities and fancy fashion bags, things like that. What I mean is the people, the brands, the companies, the organizations that influence the target customers that you want to buy your product. Now, these could be presidents of associations. They could be CTOs at very credible companies. They could be people that write blogs, people that organize events. They could be moderators in Facebook groups. 
whoever these people are, they have a lot of reach, so they can reach a lot of people. They have influence, so that people trust what they're saying. And it's one of the simplest ways to raise your brand awareness efficiently. Because if you raise your brand awareness with a select group of influential people and brands, then they're going to disseminate the message to other people. And one of the easiest ways to find who the people and brands are that influence your target customers is to use this free tool called SparkToro. And you can basically put in some criteria uh, for who your target customers are. And then SparkToro will spit out who those influencers are that you can reach out to through things like direct mail and et cetera. All right, another good approach to take with your marketing communications to raise your brand is to communicate a strong point of view. And this is clearly articulated by, I believe is the head of content strategy published an article at metadata.io. And I, I think Gong is a great example of a SaaS company that has gone with bold branding, bright colors, all sorts of effective marketing on the, the brand communication side. But also on the narrative side, he's pointing out that you, you want a clear, unique point of view. Now, if we look at a company that did this quite effectively was HubSpot. HubSpot, for years, kept pushing this narrative of inbound marketing is the hero. And outbound marketing is kind of this outdated thing that nobody likes because it's disruptive and they created a lot of negativity around outbound marketing. I'm a big fan of outbound marketing, uh, but it, it doesn't matter. The point is HubSpot took a strong position and it helped them go viral. It helped them go big, promoting this idea of inbound marketing. Now, something that I like to promote is this idea that SaaS companies need to go big or they need to go back to selling services because I, I believe SaaS companies are not greedy enough and they're focused too much on granular isolated improvements, not enough on big impact market domination. And that's that's a narrative that I'm communicating in various ways. Now, the other thing is that as you make the shift from just doing kind of short term demand generation types of marketing, you need to start developing a brand plan that is separate from your marketing plan, separate from your demand generation plan. And I'm doing a gross oversimplification just because I don't want this video to be too long. Uh, it comes from Strategic Brand Management, excellent book if you want to develop brand strategy. Uh, but these are three of the critical things you need to consider. So the brand strategy, how the brand itself as an asset creates value uh, through psychological means, through functional means and monetary means. Then there's the brand design, which is the obvious things like a logo, but also some things that perhaps you think are less obvious, like coming up with a mascot in, in business to business, coming up with sounds, and also figuring out what kinds of things you want to associate your brand in the design with. So in particular, the things that I would emphasize is the buying scenario. So uh, maybe it's like a virus hit your, your company, so you need to align your brand as a, a security software with that situation so that the brand recall is very strong when, when that event happens. Okay, and then there's also the brand communication. So this is focusing on product touch points, or prospect touch points. So things like when they're on LinkedIn, when they're on Facebook, when they're watching on TV, uh, when they're they're at the, the checkout they're, or they're ready to request a consultation, these types of things. Also the brand positioning. So what gets emphasized in the communications and the position that you want to hold in people's minds and applying the communication consistently by having a brand guide that everyone in the marketing department uses. So I just want to close with a quotation here from Jason Lemkin, basically highlighting the point that although brand and brand marketing is underemphasized in the SaaS space, especially in the business to business SaaS space, it's fundamentally how you win in the big leagues. So as Jason says, the real moat in SaaS is brand. Almost every market leader has a really good competitor or two or even three that would honestly do the job just as well. So the point that he's making is that even if your competitors have very comparable products to what you're selling, ultimately, if you win in the brand competition, you're going to win in the market. One of the most important concepts in product-led growth is that you essentially want as many people as possible trying your product. 
you want an extremely wide top of funnel. That is how the efficient engine of growth is driven by product-led growth. Now, when you're doing sales-led growth, this isn't necessarily true. You don't want as many people as possible requesting demo requests because that's very expensive. It's very expensive to dedicate an account executive's time to talk to those people individually. So how do we create an extremely wide top of funnel? Well, there are certain things to consider. One thing to consider is, does someone actually need an account to try your product? Something that you may want to have as an option is using the product without creating an account, without creating a password and an email, so that the person sees the value of the product before they're required to supply information. Now, for example, when you go to the grocery store and you're, you want to try something new, you want to sample a product, they don't ask you to sign up. They just say, here, here's the sample of the product. Try it out. If you like it, then you might buy it. All right, so another example is there's a lot of resistance to creating new accounts, particularly for digital products. One easy way to fix that friction is social sign-on. So giving people the ability to sign up using their Facebook account, their Google account, etc. All right, another example. A lot of products out there require you to download an application to install an application. Something that you may want to consider is allowing people to download the product to install the product before they have to register an account. There are all sorts of ways that you can minimize friction. Some other examples, no email confirmation. So as soon as people sign up for a new account, often they're required to receive an email and then click a confirmation before they're able to use the product. But if there's a trigger event that got somebody to sign up for a product immediately, then you want them trying it and seeing value from it immediately. And that confirmation email is a friction point. Another thing is requiring a password twice. You might wanna consider getting rid of that because again, that's just another added step another piece of friction that's preventing somebody from seeing the value of your product quickly, the time to value. So product-led growth is an engine of growth that's driven by trials, by referrals, and by word of mouth. So the key to unlocking that growth is widening the top of funnel so that as many people as possible try your product and see the value of it. I'm going to talk about the economics of free-to-play games because what we're seeing in industries such as SaaS is really just echoing what has already happened in the video game industry. Now I work for some very credible video game companies such as Sony PlayStation and Ironclad Games. So I have a good sense of how these things play out in the real world. Now in the 90s when you would buy a video game magazine often what you would get was a physical disc, a demo disc. And this demo disc had little samples of video games that hadn't yet been released or perhaps they were and you could go buy them. And the idea was you would play a little version or a little mini game, maybe the first level or um, something a little more fabricated to give you a taste of what the game is like to entice you to go and purchase it. Now, essentially today, that's what we might call a free trial. We don't really refer to that as a demo. A demo is usually a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a salesperson. Now, sometimes we do see demo-like experiences that are not one-on-one -on -one conversations. They're more interactive. Maybe it's a sandbox experience, something like that. But one of the biggest transformations that has happened in the video game industry already is the movement towards free-to-play, essentially a freemium model. Now, when you have a free-to-play game, you have two major groups of people. You have one tiny group that is a tiny fraction of your overall user base. These are the people that actually pay for things, and usually they pay for things on a recurring basis, or uh, they buy things periodically so that it kind of manifests as a, a recurring purchase. The other group is a much, much larger, and these are people that are not paying you with money. So you have a small group of people that have money, and then maybe they don't have a lot of time. But then you have the much larger group that doesn't have a lot of money, or at least isn't spending money, but they do have a lot of time. And both of these groups of people create value for your company and for your product and for each other. So 
let's look at the first group. Now, it's very obvious how they create value. They give you money. And they're also part of the user experience for the second group. So there's some value created there as well. The second group is a little more complicated because they're not paying for anything. How are they creating value for you? Well, one thing that they're doing is they're making the community better. The experience of using the product is better because there are more people using it. And the people that are paying are more willing to pay when there are other people creating value in the community in the game. Okay, another thing that happens is there are network effects that get created. So the second group, the larger group, helps create those network effects because they're a much larger group, they have more weight behind them. The other thing that they do is they create economies of scale. So the value that you invest in your product is dispersed among a much wider group of people. Other things that they do is generate word of mouth and essentially create that kind of virality that you want for your product. So the free to play gaming economics works essentially because it is the engine of economies of scale. And what we know from economics and business strategy is that economies of scale is essentially the strongest competitive advantage you can possibly have. So you can see why other industries outside of gaming are moving towards product-led growth, freemium types of models. And why does that work? Well, it's the most fundamental economics of supply and demand. When you drop the price of something, the demand surges. And when you drop the price to zero, you've basically maximized the demand for your product, the amount of people that are willing to use it to install it, etc. So again, it's that concept of how do we make the top of funnel as wide as possible so that that tiny fraction of people that do end up paying uh, becomes a, as large as it can be. Now, the thing that we learn from free to play games is that it doesn't work in all cases. There are still games that you pay for. And those are games that are too niche, for example. You don't have huge scale. The, the economies of scale just can't happen with a, a free to play model or a freemium model. And there, are, it doesn't work well with certain types of single player games because with single player games, you, you don't, network effects aren't as important. There's not that recurring multiplayer experience and the, the, the engagement. Uh, there is some engagement offline through word of mouth and stuff, but not to the tight uh, examples that we see with lots of multiplayer games. So multi freemium doesn't always work in gaming and it doesn't always work outside of gaming. Uh, later, I'm going to discuss an article from Jason Lampkin talking about what kind of scale you need to make freemium work. Okay, so the main takeaways from the free-to-play gaming economics. It can help you make you a blockbuster. It can unlock the floodgates, open a wider experience for lots of people, and make your product a huge hit. It, it can help with that anyways. So if your product has mass appeal, that can work doesn't work so well when you're dealing with a super niche because you're, you're dealing with smaller groups of people, you're not gonna get those big economics advantages. The other thing that's important is that you need to think about the non-paying users. Are they creating value? And they can create value in different ways. Are they going to generate word of mouth? If they're not, then your product-led growth with a freemium model doesn't really make sense. Are they contributing to network effects and customer captivity? Is it harder for paying users to leave your product because there are lots of non-paying users that kind of make them feel stuck to it? Uh, this happens a lot with communications things like Slack and uh, Skype and Facebook Messenger, etc. The other thing that you need to think about is, is there a better community because the community is bigger? or because there are a lot of people that aren't willing to pay for it, uh, but can contribute more to that community centered around your product. Now, the last big learning that I want you to take away from this is you can look to the video game industry as the frontier, as a predictor of what may happen in other industries with product-led growth. In the last lecture, I explained how what we're seeing with product-led growth is mimicking what's happened in the video game industry. And a big part of that we can see with the free-to-play gaming, which is some of the most popular games in the market where the demand has surged. But there's another aspect of gaming that is very relevant to product-led growth, and that's the idea of gamification. So the 
experience that happens when you're using the product, when you're onboarding the product, when you're getting emails, that kind of creates a bit of a, a reward system, some positive reinforcement, some gamification tactics. So let's take a look at some examples. This is an email from Grammarly. And basically it is a celebration of the achievements that you have taken within the app. And it's similar to the kind of rewards that you get when you play video games. So if we look over here, productivity, a new record. Wow, you just broke a record. That's kind of a gaming positive reinforcement. You were more productive than 76% of Grammarly users. So this kind of feedback is great. You see this a lot in esports where there's a ranking system and you can see how well you're performing relative to other people. Mastery, you were more accurate than 67% of Grammarly users. So you're, you're creating this positive reinforcement. You're, you're building confidence. You're, you're basically saying, we want you to continue using this product and we're going to tell you what a great job you're, you're doing. And then they're talking about vocabulary, new records. So the, Grammarly is doing an excellent job of gamification. And these are some specific types of tactics that you can employ. And what I expect is that this is the currently the frontier of product-led growth, the gamification. And in the future, there's going to be a lot more companies moving in this direction in terms of the user interface, in terms of the, the emails that are sent out. All of this is going to be gamified, at least for companies that have large economies of scale, where it's profitable to invest in this type of system for the long run. Probably isn't going to be so important when you're dealing with tiny niches because building out this kind of system may not uh, be worth it from an ROI perspective. All right, so we also see that there's um, more qualitative aspects that are tied to quantitative metrics. So they're looking at things like tone. Now, in a lot of cases, it may not be easy to say, oh, somebody was just objectively better than other users of Grammarly, but we can say that, oh, their tone was neutral or confident, sad. It's kind of like saying you're this personality or you're this astro astrology group. It's um, something that you can say about somebody that isn't necessarily objectively better or worse, but it's just this is part of your identity. And that, that's an easy cop out when you can't figure out what kind of positive feedback to give somebody. So this is similar to one of the most popular video games, which is Counter-Strike Global Offensive. And one of the things I find interesting about Counter-Strike is it's this super competitive game. So when somebody starts playing, they're just dying all the time. So how do you get somebody addicted to your product, interested in your product when they just keep losing? Well, you give them feedback, you give them recognition, and you give them awards for things that sometimes seem silly, like... You just you started the most fires. OK, you didn't you didn't kill the most people. You didn't have the most success. But what we can say about you is you started the most fires or you did some. You were this, the quietest walker in the game. You, everybody gets a reward in this system. And this is the the final stage in the game when you see what you were. You were the bullseye. OK, most headshots, uh, quad killer, uh, most four kills. Weapons master, entry fagger, moral support. So everybody gets something in a gamified system. It's not necessarily the best thing, but at least it's something to say, hey, you, you were important. You are something. You have an identity. Another example I often cite is Lemlist. Lemlist is a cold email tool. One of the challenges with cold email is that it feels kind of dirty, it feels wrong, people don't like it. So Lemlist has focused on gamification and all sorts of little tactical things that make the experience of sending cold emails feel positive and elated rather than cold and um, distrustful. So the example here is I just went in and created a new campaign called Test 2. Now, look at this. They use this little clapping like, hey, congratulations, you just created a campaign. It's kind of a stupid achievement, but that's how gamification works. You positively reinforce certain behaviors to build habits. The other thing is that there's this little pop up in the bottom right. And if you haven't tried Lemlist, I recommend just, just trying it out uh, and you'll see some cool 
notifications come up. Loving the name of your new campaign. It's kind of silly, but it's it's likable. It's gamified. And then when I com complete another task, step three, it's probably going to give me another pop-up that says, hey, congratulations on adding your leads. And then there's little hearts in the eyes. And these silly little things work because when you're having a, a product-led experience, you one of the biggest challenges for you is just getting people to complete those initial steps. And the more kind of flashy little like gambling type reinforcement things that happen, maybe it's a little sound, maybe it's a little pop-up, maybe a little uh, confetti shooting all over the place. Those actually build habits and encourage people to move on through these various steps that are required. And I want to pay close attention to the icons here because I find it really cool. They're using okay, the celebration icon, the confetti, the uh, cool little megaphone, the little angel happy face, and again, the confetti. They're using these very colorful, positive, gamified type icons, something that you might expect to see in maybe like a, a mobile casual game where, uh, you know, like a fruit ninja or one of those little gambling games. These are habit forming games, and that's the kind of thing we want with gamification. Another example is ClickUp. So ClickUp's been getting a lot of traction lately. The company got, I don't know, $100 million in Series B funding, I think, as of this recording. Doing great, super positive, well-branded company with a, a cool spokesperson. Let's talk about what they're doing. So I went through their onboarding experience. And one of the first things that you're asked to do is to customize your workspace's avatar. Now, what this reminds me of is role-playing games where you don't just go into the game and start attacking or building your economy or whatever. You actually customize what your character looks like. Is it a male? Is it a female? Are you slim? Do you have a tiny head? Is your eye color blue or brown or whatever? Um, that's similar to what ClickUp is doing, which, which is really interesting because you don't typically think of this kind of business-to-business -business SaaS company as requiring you know this personalized consumer like experience they also want you to choose your color theme so it's not just oh do i want a dark theme or a light theme it's what color do you want let's make this fun let's make this like playing a game it's not like work anymore it's play and they even use the word play with which is really interesting that's almost a sign into how much this company has committed to gamification by using the word play Okay, now just looking at that customization that I was talking about, like in an RPG, when you select what your character looks like, ClickUp wants you to customize your the colors in your interface. Now, theoretically, how does this work together? Well, I just am going to use this framework. It's from, I want to give full credit to the book Hooked. And uh, this author, I, I listened to one of his interviews in a webinar. I thought it was great. Seems like quite the expert in his field on habit formation. So the the aspect of this framework that applies to this is the idea of investment. The idea is if you get somebody to invest something in the product, time and effort, customizations, colors, etc., they're more likely to stay in your system, to stay hooked on your product. And that is part of gamification. Now, the other part of the customized experience is figuring out what stage the person is at. Now, we implemented this at a company I was working at. And it's a really interesting direction to go, which is kind of a combination of gamification and personalization. So what's your experience level in using project management tools? Are you a beginner? Are you an intermediate? Are you an expert? What's interesting here is it's not just boring text. It's uh, icons. It's rounded. It's fun. It's like clicking something for a game. It's like Deciding, okay, I'm going to play this first-person shooter, and you have to decide, are you on extremely difficult mode or extremely easy mode? So that the, the onboarding experience, the customized experience, is catered to you. And when you feel like the product has been catered to you, and you've invested time in making sure that you're getting the personalized, customized experience, you're more likely to stick to the product. And that's what ClickUp is doing right here. All right, another thing that a lot of these product-led growth companies are doing is in the onboarding sign-up process, they're getting you to invite other people. Now, one of the concepts I talked about early in the course is a wide top of funnel. And in a wide top of funnel, you want lots of people using your product. 
And lots of those people are not going to pay for your product. They're not your ICP in terms of money. But what they can do is they can generate word of mouth. And this is one way to compel them to do that by getting them invited, getting them inviting other people into the network. Now, the last thing I want to point out here is that ClickUp with their product-led growth onboarding is really trying to get you to watch the videos, the tutorials, so that you actually learn how to use the product. Now, in video games, usually there's an initial level where you do some simple tasks and they kind of teach you along the way. Well, ClickUp's trying to do that with the videos, but they recognize that a lot of people, and this is what I did, just skip the video, they close it. They don't want to bother. They just want to jump in and have an intuitive experience. So what they're doing is they're bribing you and they're saying you're going to get credits. And you see this all the time in video games where there's some sort of economy. It's a point system, a credit system, experience points. They're saying here's $10 in experience points and credit. We just want you to watch the video. Very interesting approach to gamification. I expect tons and tons of companies, especially when they're dealing with small businesses or they're dealing with uh, consumers, you're going to see much more of this type of gamification experience. It's going to create a better user experience. You're going to love the products more. You're going to onboard to the to get a, a shorter time to value faster. Uh, I think it's an excellent direction for companies to move, and I look forward to more of it. One of the most important concepts in product-led growth is habit-forming products. Now, if we look at customer captivity, it's one of the most important competitive advantages that you can have that is sustainable. Uh, if you read the book Competition Demystified by Bruce Greenwald, he lays out the key competitive advantages, and uh, the first is economies of scale, and the second is customer captivity. Now, one of the key drivers of customer captivity is that there's a habituation that happens with a product, and then they become captive to it. So things like Coca-Cola is a habit-forming drink that people are resistant to changing. A good model for explaining how to develop habit formation comes from the book Hooked, How to Build Habit Forming Products. And I present here on the left the basic model for how you do this. And there are basically four key drivers. The first is the trigger. The second is the action. The third is the reward particularly the variable reward. And then the last step is the investment. So these four drivers are how you build habit forming products. And I'm gonna go through those in detail. And again, I wanna give credit to this book and I'll also provide a link to a video that uh, goes into greater detail as well. So let's look at the trigger. So typically a trigger is a negative emotion. It's something like anxiety, loneliness or boredom when something like that happens when you experience a negative emotion you're driven to action now sometimes positive emotions are also triggers but usually it's some sort of negative thing that compels you to do something the other type of trigger is external so it's something like a call to action that says click here or play this or maybe it's advertisement that you see or pop up uh, those are also triggers now, the fourth thing with the habit formation is the action. And the key thing with actions is that you want people to be motivated to take an action. And they also have the ability to take the action. Sometimes Both of these can be limitations for why people will not take the action. And I, I want to give you an example. In one company I was working at, a SaaS company, the product had to be downloaded and installed. And initially, the company was thinking that the reason that people were not installing the application was because of ability, that they were not tech savvy, which is true. This particular customer group was not very tech savvy. And so we had a series of e automated emails explaining how to install the software. So if we had data to suggest that a given user hadn't installed the software, uh, we had a, an email sequence that explained, okay, here's how you do it. If you need help, call support or email support. And then we did step-by-step -step instructions to make it very simple. But in reality, what was probably driving the lack of action with installation was motivation. 
they just were not motivated enough to go through the laborious effort of installing the application. And what we found was when we started doing marketing through channels such as key influencers, people that were trusted by the target customers, the installation rate went higher. So it had nothing to do with ability, actually. It was motivation. It was, did they believe enough in the product to go through the effort of actually installing it? So these are two key levers that you need to be considerate of when you're building habit formation uh, through actions is, are you motivating them enough? Are you providing case studies? Are you saying the reward is worth it? And are you educating them and making sure that they're actually able to take the action that you want them to do with your product? So some key things to think about are, how do you decrease the friction that is involved in taking the action? How do you decrease the, the time investment that's required, the money that's required? How do you decrease the effort? How do you make it as seamless as possible to take action? So many times there are unnecessary roadblocks that get in the way of taking actions like signing in or signing up or uh, requiring that somebody else join you in the product for it to be useful. Uh, complexity, simply making it simpler to use, improving the user experience, improving the UI can help. Uh, reducing social deviance. So if you believe that you're the you're one of very few people that use this product, that it, it's not the default choice, then you're resistant to using it. So the way you reduce the perception of social deviance is through social proof. You say something like, join 20,000 people in using this, or the number one application for your industry for this, or you invest in things like brand awareness marketing, where this is the only application in your category or product in your category that people would consider. The other thing that you want to decrease is the perception of newness or uniqueness. So if people are not in the habit of using their product, they're resistant to it because it's not the status quo. And we know from marketing psychology uh, that people prefer uh, to stick with the status quo, to stick with inertia, to stick with momentum. That's why it's so important that you get people using your product in a frequent manner, ideally uh, less than a, a, on a weekly basis. So hopefully it's something they're using every week um, at a minimum. And uh, you can use various triggers to do that, such as sending a weekly email, setting an update uh, every week or, or even every three days or something. Because if, if you don't build that momentum, people are going to be resistant to doing something that is kind of out of, new or out of the ordinary routine. The other key driver is the reward. So there was a trigger that drove an action and then ideally the action produces some sort of reward and what you want to do with your product is give them what they want but then you leave them wanting more so for example they get to level three in your product that unlocks some sort of deal or maybe maybe it's a discount or maybe they get extra usage or an extra seat in your product by getting to level three by using your product maybe 30 times a month something like that but level four, you get an even better deal. And if you just keep going, uh, you're on the verge of unlocking all these other key features and bonuses, et cetera. The other thing that you wanna do, and this is a bit counterintuitive, is reward your users inconsistently. Now, a lot of marketing psychology suggests that consistency is a good thing. For example, when we're looking at how to influence people, one way you do that, according to Dr. Robert Cialdini, is you play to the idea that people want to be perceived as consistent. And when you show that they're being inconsistent by not using your product or not buying from you, then there's this cognitive dissonance that's created um, and people want to reconcile that. However, when we're talking about habit forming products and rewards, we actually want to reward people inconsistently. So be because there's a, a spike in people's reward systems, their, their, their biological mental systems, when the reward is inconsistent, it's, it's uh, uh, there's an elation that's created. So you can give people small rewards here and there for consistent behavior, but then you want kind of them to unlock a treasure box or something kind of on some sort of random schedule. 
And this has been well established in psychological research for a long time that uh, the, the best motivator of behavior is inconsistent rewards based on the be desired behavior that you want, i.e. using your product. And there are three types of rewards, essentially. There are social rewards that come from other people or external recognition, so things like competition. Uh, we, I saw that, I presented that earlier with Grammarly, showing how much better than you are than other people, uh, what percentile you're in. Romance is another form of social reward, so we look at applications like Tinder, etc. Now, the second category of rewards is rewards of the hunt. And again, I'm, I'm giving full credit to the Hooked book uh, for detailing all of these. I, these are not my original ideas or my original research. Uh, so examples of rewards of the hunt would be food and money. So typical types of rewards you would think of. And the last type of reward is rewards of the self. And this are these are things like, am I mastering a skill? would be one of the key ones. And we see that all the time with gamification. Okay, and the last driver of habit formation is investment. Are people investing in your product in some way? Are they, uh, in, are you playing on the idea of the endowment effect? Because we know from marketing psychology, one of the most established concepts is that people value things when they're theirs, when they feel like they've been personally invested in a product. And they overvalued, in fact. So an example of this is I, I recently saw some research indicating that the one of the strongest indicators of a successful product pitch is that the pitch involved getting people to collaborate in the pitch. So you're not just speaking to people, but you're getting them to collaborate in the process. And this is something that you want to do in the product. It's not just top down. It's not just, here's the product, we've created this for you. It's, no, we want you involved in the creation process so that it becomes yours. And some examples of this are when you get people to upload data, uh, when you get them to do things like maybe an integration where it's got to sync with your accounting data or your CRM data, something like that. Uploading content is also an example. You upload your photo or you upload some information about uh, your business, these types of things are also investments. Customization. So um, how do you want to be notified? Are you adjusting the color? We saw this with ClickUp, adjusting the color of the interface. These are forms of investments. Also getting followers, getting people on your social media to uh, follow you when you're posting updates, another form of investment. So to bring this all together, I'm going to use a simple case study, which is Grammarly. Grammarly is doing a great job of product-led growth, and they're using habit formation as a way to spur that growth. So if we look at the trigger, they have various triggers that they're creating through their product. Uh, one is integrations with Microsoft Word, integrations with Chrome, integrations with Gmail, integrations with Twitter, and they're also just doing broad brand marketing to create awareness. All of these are triggers to take the action of using the product. Now, there are also some negative internal triggers. So things like I am insecure about my English, or I'm insecure about my grammar, or I'm worried that my boss is going to judge me because I'm sending an email that doesn't sound professional. So these are also triggers that drive people to use Grammarly. And the action that people take when they use it is they're going to change their wording. They're going to fix the grammar. They're going to fix the smoothness or the professional soundingness of whatever it is that they're writing. The reward. Rewards are varied. They're, you have increased confidence. Okay, You're no longer worried about, did I word this correctly? Did I make an ESL mistake? Or did, did I mistake, use a mistake in whatever language I'm uh, writing this in, there is anxiety really. It's like, oh, okay, now I can press send because I'm, I'm less worried about spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, etc. The most basic reward is just that you've made a correction and there's some little satisfying experience when you see that that correction has been made in the, the product. There's also mastery. You're, you're learning and getting better at writing because you're seeing certain mistakes that you make. You're, you're writing a lot of unnecessary words. You're, you're, there's a common grammatical mistake that you frequently make. So there's some sort of mastery there. There's also social acceptance as a reward. 
people might feel that they're ostracized because they don't sound professional or they don't look professional. So you're more likely to be accepted when your writing skills are good. And you're also investing in Grammarly when you do things like integrate it with other applications you use. So I'm going to look on the right here just to show some specific examples. So one of the key things that Grammarly is doing, and it's probably a data-driven decision, I'm, I'm guessing that their data show that when people add Grammarly to Chrome, that's probably highly correlated with customer captivity. These are the people that stick to Grammarly and become paying users and use it frequently. So this is an example of a trigger. It, when people open Chrome and they see Grammarly, there's a trigger to take an action. It's also a form of investment. By integrating it with Chrome, you've invested and you're more captive to the product. Similarly, we see when you open Chrome, there is an open Grammarly. So Grammarly is right there. Every time I use Word, there's a trigger to use Grammarly at the same time. And that's also a form of investment. There's also little rewards that happen when you use the product or sign up for the product. Success, there's, there's enthusiasm, there's uh, positive reinforcement. And that too is a form of reward, a form of uh, kind of social recognition and also uh, a form of mastery too. And here, this is an example I highlighted earlier when we talked about gamification is other forms of recognition in terms of how well you are doing compared to other people. So productivity, a new record. Okay, you're getting awesome. You get a gold star. Well, I guess a white star on a green background in this case. Uh, you were more productive than 76% of Grammarly users. Wow. And you can even share and tweet this to brag about how awesome you are. So Grammarly, great example of product-led growth, great example of a habit-forming product. I want to talk about something that's very important. This is a mistake that I used to make all the time early in my career. And that is asking people to do something without providing a reason. Now, when I first started my career, I was working at a small company. And at small companies, it's all about how quickly you can get things done and how efficiently. And sometimes what ends up falling by the wayside is the, the politics, the niceties, the politeness. So the problem is that when you ask people to do something without giving a reason, they can imagine all sorts of bad reasons why you're asking. You're asking because you want them to look bad, you're asking because you're telling them they did a bad job, or they might just think you're dumb and think, oh, why are they asking me to do this? Uh, it, it's a, a bad decision to make. They might also think that when you ask them for something, you're going to spam them or you're going to do something malicious with the information that you're given, or whatever it is that you're given. So a very specific example of this in product marketing is asking for someone's email. People do not like providing their email because they think they're going to get bombarded with marketing messages that they're not interested in. So one of the most effective ways to capture someone's email is to simply say, Please provide an email so that we know where to send this white paper, or we know where to send the webinar inv invitation, or we know where to send the calendar confirmation for a demo or something like that. Now, there's been some really interesting research uh, by Dr. Robert Chialdini that shows that simply providing a reason, even if that reason is arbitrary or almost meaningless, increases compliance with what you're asking for significantly. So one of the studies that was done was there were people waiting in line and he would have people try to cut in line and say, uh, excuse me, can I get ahead? Versus, excuse me, uh, can I get ahead because I'm in a rush? And simply providing the reason as ridiculous as I'm in a rush or I, I, I'd like to be in the front, as silly as it sounds, people are more likely to comply. And one of the reasons is that people are, they're looking for rationality. They want justification for why they're doing something. And when you provide a reason, it's very effective. A good example that I find, because I, I travel internationally all the time and I'm, I'm looking at signage. And often there's signs in bathrooms that say things like, do not put uh, tissue in the toilet. 
and in some countries or some municipalities, it just says, do not do this. It's a very authoritative approach, which doesn't work in a lot of countries. So when you're in countries maybe like Israel or the United States, where you're, you might encounter people that are resistant to authority because the power distance is smaller in these countries. So what you, what you have to do or what you should do to get compliance is provide reasons. Okay, do not put the tissue in the, wall, in, in the toilet because it's going to clog or because our pipes are particularly small, something like that. So you can see how this plays out in your marketing messages. You're not just telling users what to do, you're telling them and providing justification. Okay, here's the benefit of doing that or you should do this because we want to give you why. Now this also plays out politically internally. So for example, I was a global product marketing manager for Sony PlayStation. I had to work with a lot of people that I did not have direct authority or over. So people in other departments or other specialties in, in London or Tokyo or wherever. And what, what I used to do is I, I tried to be efficient. I just said, you know, this is what, this is what I would like to happen. And I didn't provide reasons, but when I started providing reasons, then not only are people less suspicious of what I'm asking for, and not only are they more interested in hearing what I have to say, but they're also just giving me better results. By giving context for what I'm asking for, they're better able to fulfill my, what my request is. So providing that clarity, providing reasons is gonna have a substantial impact on your product marketing. One of the most common mistakes that I see in product-led growth is that companies will require a work email to sign up for something. Now that might be a free trial, it might be a demo request, it might be registering for a webinar, downloading a white paper, any sort of thing that gets people in the funnel. Now I think what they're trying to do is filter people out. They're trying to get out people that are maybe too small, maybe they haven't set up a company yet, but this is shooting yourself in the foot. And I'm gonna explain some of the key reasons why. One of the key principles I mentioned earlier is that with product-led growth, you want to have as wide a top of funnel, tofu, as possible. So when you restrict the submissions or the signups to people that are willing to provide a work email, you're narrowing the top of funnel. And this has a lot of negative consequences. So some of the key ones I wanna point out is that it's annoying. I find this very annoying because I have multiple email addresses and often when I'm signing up for a free trial, requesting a demo, I don't want it associated with my work emails. I want it tied to my personal emails. And there are a number of reasons that are very practical for this for some people and why they would find it annoying is that the autofill. So if they're using their personal laptop, they may automatically have the text fields filled with their personal email, their Gmail, their Yahoo, etc. And if I'm doing research at an odd hour or I'm traveling, I, I don't want to have to set up the VPN just to be able to use my work laptop. Okay, so the other reason is that it's somewhat arrogant to assume that you know your customers better than you actually do. And time and time again with product-led growth, this is a mistake that I see. The company assumes they know the customer journey better than they do, and they make a lot of assumptions. And the key assumption here is that you are not a valid candidate for this product if you don't have a work email to supply and you're not willing to supply a work email. And that's just completely not true. Another thing that you're doing is that you're alienating very important users from accessing your product. And again, one of the most important concepts in product-led growth is that you want a wide top of funnel. You want a lot of people using your product because there are benefits that come from people that don't buy your product, people that generate word of mouth, people that talk about it, people that help create strong network effects and customer captivity that goes beyond simply paying for the product. 
So you should not be mandating that people provide a work email. All right, so I wanna get into the specifics about some of the people that you're alienating when you require a work email to sign up. The first most important group is consultants. So there are management consultants, there are accountants, there are web developers, there are all sorts of people that help companies and often they're independent and they help multiple companies. So if you have a single consultant who signs up with his or her Gmail account, that person might influence 10, 20, or even thousands of companies that have work emails, email addresses. But just because the consultant uses a Gmail address, which is completely valid, there's lots of consultants who make six-figure salaries and they consult for Fortune 500 companies, they don't want to have to bother with setting up some uh, official email address because it, it breaks their workflow. They'd rather just use Gmail. Gmail syncs easily with Google Slides and, and their entire IT system. When you're independent and agile, it makes sense. So you're alienating these consultants and they a single consultant who signs up with a Gmail address is probably more valuable to you than a single employee who has a work email address because they influence more people. So you're, you're alienating probably your most important group of uh, influencers in a lot of cases. All right, now the second group that you're alienating is people that do research in the evenings. So people are often busy in meetings during the day, they're doing their job, they're going through their processes, they're checking off boxes. And then in the evening, they go on LinkedIn, they go on Facebook, they're scrolling, they're doing research on Google, and that's when they're in the stage where they're looking for new products to try. And if you're requiring that they go back to their work email to register, you're, you've basically shot yourself in the foot. At the stage where they're doing research, it's highly likely that they're going to want to use their personal email address. A third group that you could be alienating is board directors. So there are people who have very strong influence in companies that are on the board of directors. They don't necessarily have a work email associated with that specific company because maybe they run their own business, maybe they're the CEO of another company, and they might sign up for a free trial of your product just because, hey, uh, maybe the company I'm a board director for could use it but I don't want it associated with my personal business, but I'm okay with signing up using my Yahoo, my Gmail, et cetera. You're basically saying, we don't want you. We don't want you important board director. We only want uh, direct uh, frontline employees. You're also alienating job changers, which is everyone, especially in certain industries like tech. People are changing jobs every year, you know, every couple of years. This isn't the 1950s when job loyalty was for life. People change jobs and the second they change a job, they lose their company email. And it's gonna be much, much harder for them to do a search in their email system to find your product, to find their free trial, to find your welcome email, if it's tied to an employee email address they no longer have access to. You're also alienating people that are affiliated with multiple companies. Now, this isn't always true because they may have a particular company in mind when they sign up for your product. But there are lots of people that are associated with multiple companies. They don't necessarily want this free trial associated with one in particular. So it becomes a frustrating point of friction when you force them, you compel them to choose a single email address. Now, for example, I know an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur he owns a restaurant, he owns a cleaning company, he owns a maintenance company. What email is he supposed to use? We don't know. There are also people that work half-time at one company, part-time at another, they're freelancing on the side. And these aren't, there, there's kind of this assumption that if somebody doesn't have a work email, they're not serious, maybe they don't make enough money to be able to afford the product. That's not true. That's old school thinking when people had jobs for life, they had a lot of job security, they stayed loyal. This isn't the world we're working in now. We're working in a world of people who work from home, who have a gig system, and they are associated with multiple companies, often simultaneously.
Now, the last group is you're alienating people who are using their personal email for social media. And let's face it, that's most people. And people, when they sign up for something using their Instagram, using their Facebook, using their LinkedIn, maybe it's a demo request, they want the entry fields to be autofilled. If you are going to force them to delete the autofill, which is their personal email, and replace it with a work email, you're basically saying, I don't want you to convert. I paid for you to click, but I am not going to get the conversion. So these are some of the key groups of people you're alienating by requiring a work email address. Now, I also want to highlight that there was an interesting case study that I saw on LinkedIn from OpenView that showed that people who provided a personal email actually ended up being some of the highest revenue customers for a product. So even statistically, despite all the reasons I just said that are very qualitative, that are very um, annoying to users, you're actually just saying, I don't want more revenue because I'm going to require that people provide a work email address. What does product led really mean? To explain that, I'm going to talk about what it means to be sales led, marketing led, design led. Traditionally, when we use these terms, what it meant was which department in the company had the most power and influence? Who was driving the ship of the organization? Traditionally, sales led companies were business to business companies because getting large contracts with big Fortune 500 clients, for example, was the key driver of value. So often business to business companies were led by the sales department, the sales executives. In contrast, business to consumer businesses were marketing led. They were driven by marketing executives. So for example, companies such as Procter & Gamble are largely run by brand managers who have a tilt towards marketing. Occasionally, there will be a company, Apple, for example, that is design-led, where it's the design department, the user experience that is driving and kind of making the final decisions on the products. Now, the interesting thing here is a lead is a, internal kind of political thing about who has the most power in the organization. But when we talk about product led, it doesn't really mean the same thing. What we really mean when we say product led is we're talking about what is driving the user acquisition, what is driving the go to market marketing tactics. And it's using the product as the tool of acquisition as the tool that's generating word of mouth. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the marketing department is not the one driving people in that direction, because what it means is that you're not driving awareness through things like large brand awareness campaigns that you would typically see in a marketing-led company. So I wanna highlight that linguistic, Linguistically, there's been a bit of a shift where when we're talking about product led, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the product management team that's driving the company, although in a lot of cases that's true. What we really mean is that the way to grow in the market is by using the product itself as a marketing tool. I travel a lot. I'm currently in Belgrade, Serbia. I was just in Istanbul, Turkey and traveling around Turkey for a month. I spend a lot of time staying in hotels. And one thing that I cannot figure out a lot of the time is how the heck to use the thermostats. There's so many different buttons, so many different icons. It should be very simple, right? Can I turn the, the temperature up and can I turn it down? But uh, there, there are so many controls, it's, it's very, very complicated. And this is true in a lot of cases. When people get into their cars for the first time, they can't figure out the controls and the dials on, on the door. And 
there's just a lot of confusion with user experiences. This happens with software products. It happens with lots of electronics, remote controls for televisions. So what's happening here is really not the fault of companies. What companies are doing is they're optimizing in a way that makes sense for their revenue. Because who they're marketing to with a lot of these business to business transactions is it's not the end user. They are marketing to the buyer, to the executives, to the procurement officers. And what are these people concerned about? They're concerned about a lot of the time just reducing the total cost of ownership. So how efficient, how cheap is the product? Can we get these installed in a hundred buildings or a hundred floors, whatever? It's a, a purchase decision by somebody who really isn't going to be using the product at all. It's not the end consumer who's buying it. And we see this a lot of the time in economics, things like why your experience with your medical doctor is not great is because you're not the customer. You're not the one who's paying. It's the insurance companies that are the customers. So there are lots of systems that are optimized for the buyer, often to the detriment of the end consumer, the person that's actually using the product. But the transition we're seeing now with product-led growth is the hero is the end user. It is optimizing the experience for the end user, that person that's actually using the thermostat, that person that's using Slack, that person that is repeatedly getting into a habit of using the product. So it is a bottoms-up approach rather than a top-down. It's not the CEO made this purchase and therefore you have to use it. You have to get used to using this product. It's more people on the front lines in the trenches are starting to use products that are free, things like Slack, and then the pressure starts getting pushed up to the executives who say, okay, we better buy the premium versions of this, the departments, the teams, the demand units, as serious decisions would call them, are in the habit of using it. This is how they've created efficiencies. So that's how you create demand from the bottom up. And that's why with product-led growth, you really need to put the user front and center. Even if a lot of those users ultimately don't buy the product, again, we're talking about how do we increase the top of funnel to create a great experience for tons of users so that then they generate word of mouth and start pushing the message up and across to other people to increase demand for your paid product in the end. Most free trials are time-based. It's something like 30 days, 14 days, seven days to try the product. And there's some research to suggest that perhaps the length of your trial doesn't matter all that much. But something that I really think you need to consider is a free trial that is not based on time, but is based on usage or based on behavior in the product. Personally, I get pretty annoyed when I sign up for free trials, and here's why. There's usually some sort of trigger event where I go and sign up for free trials for multiple products. So maybe three, four different products. I try them out. And then what ends up happening is after seven days or something, they start pressuring me to buy the product. And they're like, oh, okay, you're, you're running out of time. The free trial is coming to an end. Buy the product. And again, I think that makes perfect sense, right? Scarcity drives action. If there's some sort of time constraint that pushes people to buy, then yeah, you want to leverage that to try to get the sale. But for me, I barely use the product. I didn't understand how to use the product. I might receive emails, automated emails from somebody in the company saying, how are you enjoying the product? I respond to those messages and nobody gets back to me because I haven't, I haven't onboarded properly. I have not seen the value in the product, but yet they're still pushing me to buy it. That is a bad approach to product-led growth because with product-led growth, you want to put the value first, okay? You want the user to experience whatever it is that your product delivers, solving a problem, adding efficiencies, whatever that value proposition is before you start putting up a paywall and saying, hey, you should buy us. So I think too often what happens with time-based trials, and, and again, they have their place. I'm not, I'm not saying they're useless, and I think it's a great place to start. But the problem is that you're using a one-size-fits-all 
And for a lot of people, they're not going to see value in seven days, 14 days. They may not see value ever. And the reason has nothing to do with the length of the trial. It's that the onboarding experience isn't optimized for them. It's not personalized to them. Now, if you base it on if you base your trial on usage, it is inherently customized. It has been customized to the experience of that specific user because it's not based on time and a one-size-fits-all one model. And you can know from looking at your data that there is probably a, a, an inflection point after X number of transactions in your product or feature usage or whatever where there are, there's a high probability they're going to become a paying user or at least a super user who then advocates for your product elsewhere. So a company, I'm always bragging about this company, SparkToro, founded by the founder of Moz, SEO Moz, formerly known as, and it's a, it's a product I really love. But I only get 10 searches per month. Now, for me, for what I'm doing right now, that's actually all I need. So I am a, a freemium user. I'm not, I'm not ready to commit to the paid plan. But I am creating value for SparkToro. I'm talking about it right now in this video. I talk about it to anybody who I, I consult with, who I believe will benefit from key influencers and PR outreach. I am generating word of mouth for the business. So I am on the $0 plan and that's fine. If they pressure me to buy, I'm not gonna buy because I just do not have enough need at this point for more than 10 searches per month. And I regularly get these emails from SparkToro where they're like, hey, Congratulations, we've just gifted you 10 extra searches. And that's an excuse to email me and keep me engaged to keep SparkToro top of mind for me. So what I encourage you to do is look at your data. Try to identify what behaviors are predictive of super users, super active users, what behaviors are predictive of people that are gonna become paying users, and use usage as the driver and limitation of the trial. So the goal becomes getting people to actually get value from the product, to behave in the product so that they benefit rather than just focusing on some arbitrary time limit where you don't even know if they've had a good experience in the product. Here is a good example of a company that does product-led growth. It is Rocket Reach. Rocket Reach is this company that I keep running into whenever I am searching for somebody on Google and I want to get their contact information, such as their emails. So today, there were two people I needed to reach out to. I Googled their names. Rocket Reach showed up in the search results. And I was able to get two emails per person. Turns out one of them wasn't valid. That's fine. I had a backup. So what the learning is here is that getting people to see the value of your product before you put them through the sales pitch and convince them they need to pay for it is often a lot better because then they're basically convincing themselves to buy it because they, they've already seen the value. And basically what I'm able to do is get contact information for people by clicking that. And what it's going to do is it's going to show some email addresses. Uh, so apparently it has 12 email addresses for me. A lot of them are going to be outdated, but uh, that's fine. I mean, as long as one of them works, then mission accomplished. I've seen the value of Rocket Reach by doing that, by getting somebody's contact information. Now, I mean, this is, this is some incorrect information. I've never lived in Colorado. So this picture is extremely... Uh, old and this position is old as well, but uh, it's useful. I mean, there's my email address. This used to be an email address that I used. So what they're doing is they're limiting you to a usage based experience. And so if we take a look at the pricing, Okay, so different plans that you can sign up for, but that, that's kind of the secondary point, right? The primary point is just get people using it, getting them trying it out. So let's look at my current account. Okay, I'm on the free plan, which is $0 monthly. It's active. 
and total lookups remaining zero. Okay, so I've used up all that I can for this month, which was only three lookups. This is interesting because usually with a usage-based experience, you would get more than three. You might get like 10 or something like that. And they're, they're already pushing me to sign up. Now, I find this super effective because I always run into this company and I think the branding is memorable. There's a picture of a rocket. The brand name is Rocket. It's useful. I'm getting in the habit of using it. Now, what's going to happen is a lot of people are never going to buy it. They are not going to have a need to do more than three searches a month. Okay. Uh, but there are super users that are definitely going to want to do more than three per month. So these are SDRs, sales development reps, BDRs, business development reps, people that are doing a lot of outbound business to business marketing. Uh, as, as soon as they see that this works three times, they are, are highly likely to sign up and start using it all the time. Now, what about the people that only use it three times? I, I don't actually use this that often. But what I do do is I make videos like this and I create courses and I'm already talking about Rocket Reach to you guys. So I am, even though I'm not paying Rocket Reach, I'm creating value for them by spreading a word of mouth. And word of mouth is basically the cheapest acquisition channel that you can have. Now, what they're not doing is they're not doing what most SaaS companies do, which is have uh, your top of funnel experience being, here's the value of the product, here are the use cases, here are the features, here are the benefits, uh, sign up for a seven day trial. And what ends up happening in most of those cases is people sign up for the seven day trial, they never log into the product again, they get bombarded with emails that are just like, oh, buy now, you have seven days left, you have three days left, buy it, buy it, buy it. Uh, here, they're actually focused on usage. They're focused on you getting value from the product so that you spread word of mouth, so that you uh, become an active and paying user. And I, I think this is, in general, a much more effective approach. Now, I'm, I'm biased towards usage-based trial experiences, personally, as opposed to time-based ones, in general. Because for me, I... When I get bombarded with emails that are saying, you know, you have three days left in your trial, and I'm like, I don't remember your brand name. I, I, I barely remember what you do. I, I didn't even get around to using your product properly, and you're already telling me to buy the product. But when you base the trial experience or the freemium experience on usage, then it's like, yes, okay, that person that has used this three times knows the value of this product. Then they can be convinced to buy it. But if somebody hasn't reached that stage where they've had an aha moment, then what is the point of pressuring them to, to buy it? It is not a personalized experience. A personalized experience is when you are using user behavior and catering the message based on that. That's when you can upsell somebody, when the behavior is aligned and the value has been realized. So that, that's what I love about Rocket Reach is they, they haven't been, I, I, I use this periodically and every time that need arises, they're the top company to show up in my searches. So I, I, I believe in the product. I'm, I'm already convinced that it's effective. So the pricing is I'm ready for that conversation as opposed to them just constantly trying to push people to, uh, to, to buy the product. And usually what ends up happening in most cases is that the vast majority of people that sign up for free trial don't buy it. The vast majority never sign in again. Uh, a lot of them don't even activate their accounts. And here I'm having a great product experience and I'm talking about it in a flattering way. So I, I think it's a great way to approach product led growth. What I'm going to walk through is what you could potentially do after someone signs up for your free account from an email perspective. A company that I feel has done this quite well after signing up for numerous products online and seeing the emails coming through is FreshBooks. So on the left here, I have their subject line, welcome to FreshBooks. There's a little wave icon, exclamation mark, let's get you started. Okay, so one of the key things here is 
having the brand name so that people can search for it. So they, they may have lost the email. They want to be able to search for it. They want to be able to hit control F if they're on a Windows device to be able to locate that brand name. Now, the other thing is that if your software integrates with another major piece of software, like perhaps Amazon, QuickBooks, something like that, you probably want to put that brand name somewhere, if not in the subject line, at least in the text that they see immediately below the subject line. Okay, so if we take a look at the email itself, hi, Decker, welcome to FreshBooks. All right, there's some personalization there. I don't really care because... Um, it, this kind of personalization, people know that it's fake, that it, it's not a, you know, person, a, a person writing a one-on-one -on -one email, but uh, it may help with deliverability, which is something you need to be concerned with if you're using something like MailChimp, is your automated emails may not actually be received, so make sure you're checking deliverability rates. I'm Alex from the support team, and I want to let you know in a few, a few of the best ways to get up and running on the platform. Now, the, the main thing that I... I like about this email is that it's it's the jobs to be done. It is the key use cases, the key actions that people can take. Send an invoice, use online payments, file expenses, create a quote. These are the key things people want to do. So you're basically creating a choose your own adventure. Oh, I just signed up for FreshBooks. What's the first thing I want to do? Do I want to send an invoice? Do I want to create a quote? Like these are actionable things that they can click. And then when they click it, they're brought directly into the software to do that action. So if somebody signs up for a free trial, there's probably been some trigger event where they have a need, right? It may be, oh, shoot, I have a client now. I need to create a quote or they need a formal quote. I'm going to sign up for FreshBooks. Get them to do that. Get them to that aha moment. Get them to that short time to value where they see, okay, this, this product actually delivers what I want it to do. Now, there are some thinking out there that with emails, you should only have one call to action. Uh, I see the advantage there that you're pushing people to take an action. They don't have to think too much, but uh, I disagree with it a lot of the time because I, I think it's kind of a hubris assumption to think you know what somebody wants to do. I think it's better to give them options so that you're, instead of just guessing uh, as to what they want to do. Now, if you have tons of data that says, 95% of people that sign up for a free trial, this is the one thing they want to do, or you have a product that only does one thing, then sure, one single call to action. But for more medium to it, uh, highly sophisticated software, you're, you're going to want multiple options. And there are other products that do this. For example, Keep uh, uses this in their emails where they give people like four or five options um, to show what they're interested in. Okay, so they also have this tutorial video. A lot of people are not going to bother clicking the video, but it, but it's great for those that are, are more procedural in how they approach things and less intuitive. They'll, they'll want to walk through that. And if you need a bit of help, just reply to this email. Okay, this is great. So you can actually reply to Alex here, which is awesome. If you have any questions, there's no need to like go to the contact page, submit a ticket on the support form. Uh, and and there, there's multiple options here. You can reply or you can you can click here, which I assume goes to like a submission form, or you can watch the webinar. So we're giving options to people. And we know from marketing psychology that people are more likely to do something or to take ownership of a an action if they've been given options and they feel like they have agency. Whereas when you push people and you say, this is what you need to do, uh, often they, they push back and say no. They just say no. Instead of saying option A, B, or C, they just say no options at all. Um, you know, maybe this is a, a little, a few too many options, but I think one, two, three, four, five, I think having like six, seven options is, is, is great, especially at this stage, because at this stage, you probably do not have a lot of data on what the users want or what they're doing. So providing options can kind of, um, lead them in the direction that they want to go. Now, later on, I'm going to talk about more advanced ways to nurture people after they sign up. But this is this is one of the most fundamental, basic ways to get started. And a big problem that I see with emails and automation and email nurturing is people become overwhelmed and they think, oh, okay, we need a lead scoring system. We need automated emails putting people through this funnel and this funnel and this funnel and segmentations based on personas. And it, what ends up happening is it just never gets done because you're, you're putting 
too much work up front for something that is just way too advanced. It's better just to start simple with something like an effective welcome email. And the welcome email is very important because it is uh, an email that people are highly likely to open and take action on because it's so closely tied to whatever the trigger event was that got them to sign up for your your free trial, your freemium offering, your free account. Um, another thing that I, I think they're doing here and a lot of companies are doing is creating likability with uh, icons like this. And so, some companies even put them in the emails like um, smiley faces, et cetera. Likeability, we know from marketing psychology, is a persuasive method. Another thing is it's pretty simple, not a whole lot of images. I wouldn't mind seeing a picture of Alex to make it more personable so that people are more likely to respond. Um, too much imagery and you're probably going to get flagged as spam, even if people opted in. Uh, you got some branding, which is nice. Uh, you know, a decent design. It's not nothing super flashy, uh, but overall pretty effective, I would say, from FreshBooks. I think it's a good template to follow. Let's take a look at another example. Okay, so Toggle Track. Now, when, when you sign up for Toggle, which is this, this time tracking software, you get two emails simultaneously. So technically, this isn't the welcome email, but uh, I, I'm highlighting it because I think they do a good job of something that a lot of companies don't. But it, it's sent at the, effectively the same time as the welcome email. At least that happened to me. You know, maybe there was an event that triggered that. Uh, that won't happen for you, but... Uh, I think it's a good example regardless. Okay, so we got some nice branding, not, you know, not a, a giant photo or anything like that. Hi, name. Uh, when you log into Toggle Track, you can't miss the big pink start button. That's a perfect way to track what you're doing right now. <clears throat> okay, so basically what they're trying to do is somebody just signed up for the product. Let's just get them doing the basic thing, which is time tracking. They got, they're highlighting where it is in the UI. Okay, that's awesome because there's lots of free trials I've signed up for and I go into the product and I just, I'm overwhelmed. There's, there are too many options. I don't even know where to start. So they're showing you where to start with these little arrows. And uh, they also do a good job in the interface um, kind of with the little, um, what do I want to say? Kind of like a handwritten note with a, a little handwritten arrow that shows you, oh, this is where you hit the start button and here is where you type in your project name. So uh, the UI experience for onboarding is incredibly important, but we're focusing here on the emails. Uh, and they're just showing you, okay, manual mode, how to add time. So for example, if you forgot that you worked an hour yesterday and you wanna add it now, they show you how to do that. And they're also pushing you to uh, download the mobile app or the desktop app or just continue using it on the cloud through the web. So pretty cool, just sticking to the basic actions that you want people to take after they sign up. So this is their actual welcome email. Thanks for signing up. We made Toggle Track has helped us solve a problem. Where the heck is our time going? Okay. I don't, I, personally, I don't really like this. I think it's a lot of fluff. Uh, maybe that's just me. I, I, I like very direct, succinct types of terminology. Uh, if your brand is more friendly and personable, then okay, that makes sense. I don't know why they have a period there, but um, they're using some social proof here. So joining 400,000 daily users. Okay, so this might address if people are considering, do I use um, another clocking software or do I use Toggle Track? Oh, well, 400,000 people are using Toggle. Okay, maybe I'll continue using it. A mistake that I think companies make with emails after people sign up is they assume a high, a, a much higher degree of awareness and brand affinity than is true. So when somebody signs up for your trial, they are not ready to buy it a lot of the time. And they're actually considering competitors and they may not even remember that they signed up for your product. So doing things that continues to sell your product and why you're the best uh, I think is is a very good approach. Now, whether that belongs in, in the welcome email up front, uh, I question it. I, I think maybe perhaps further down uh, after they've seen some of the value. But uh, who knows? Maybe they have some data-driven evidence to support this approach. Let's get you started. So they're really trying to push you to download these plugins, applications, and stuff. I, I think what they're trying to do is like lock you in so that you're captive. Like if... If Toggle Track is everywhere, it's on your desktop, it's on your phone, you're 
they can send you push notifications. Perhaps the application starts when you restart your computer. So you're more likely to re-engage in it. So a lot of their data probably show that people who are installed on through the entire ecosystem are more likely to have high retention and are, are going to reach that aha moment. That, that's just a guess from what I'm seeing. Record your first time in one simple click. Okay, so they're they're going to show you like a how-to article on how to how to use the software. It's basically a tutorial. If you're evaluating Toggle Track for your team, you can try your premium features free for 30 days. Okay, um, I think it's, I think it's a they're asking for a lot up front here, um, rather than just focusing on the features of the product. I would say, but that's just my personal opinion. It signed off from the CEO, kind of personal ball, which is which is cute. Okay, uh, I signed up for Canva. Canva, amazing product. I I wish I could buy stock in Canva. I think it's phenomenal. Uh, it, probably my single favorite product of the last five years. It's amazing. The price, I mean, the freemium account alone is tremendously valuable. I, I almost want to pay for their pro account just to show that I support this company. But uh, one thing I would question is this confirmation email. Now, uh, I, maybe this is legal protection. Maybe their, their counsel has advised they do this. But there has been a case study in, uh, from the author of Product Lake Growth where he talks about a case where a company eliminated the confirmation emails and they saw an exponential growth in the user base for their product because this is kind of a from the user's perspective this is a redundant pointless step it's kind of like asking for your password twice or asking to put in your email twice does anybody enjoy doing that no it, it kind of slows down the product-led growth experience here's a company that I, I think does a decent job so amz stout is helping amazon sellers they have basically three calls to action um, in the body text Profitable products report. So we know that in the Amazon seller space, the one of the highest priorities for them is identifying new products out of the portfolio. It's a very strategic question. So this is showing you how to get prof, how to find profitable products. High products list. So what products are trending and under one dollar products. Uh, so pushing people in into these actions to get engaged. I I, I think it's it's awesome. Uh, and also there's a call to action at the bottom for ad pro extension. It can never hurt in your emails to have a hard call to action or hard offer at the bottom, whether that's upgrade now, buy now. Uh, in some cases, it might just be a request a demo. So if you have like a, a freemium account, but to push people to advanced or pro account, it's a demo request. You can always have that at the bottom. It It's not too aggressive if, it, if it's not up front. So. There's no, there's no reason not to have it. Okay, so uh, again, we're, we're just kind of walking through the basic approach to email nurturing. And later we'll talk about the, the more advanced approach, which few companies get around to doing effectively. And one of the basic templates that we have comes from incharge.io. And this is a typical flow for a 14-day email nurturing for a trial. So they're recommending day one is a welcome email. So we went through some examples of welcome emails, focusing on case studies, or sorry, focusing on features, um, but you can also uh, move into case studies and other emails. I, I also think that these can be combined. You can talk about uh, your welcome features, and then at the bottom of the email, you can have a case study to kind of reinforce the decision to, to work with this particular product. After the welcome email, they recommend that you have a product tip email. So this might be the main benefit or main feature or use case that your product offers. If people are not doing kind of the main thing that you offer, then there's a very, very low probability that they're going to continue using your product, let alone buy it ultimately or brag about it to their friends so that they join and start using it. And you notice that there's there's about a two day separation between these emails, and you follow it up again with another product tip. The idea here is that when people sign up for an email, there's some sort of trigger event that got them to do it. 
So this is when they're engaged. This is when they're attentive. So you notice that the cadence of the emails is actually pretty quick. Typically with nurturing, you might send an email every six days, maybe every two weeks. Here, we're sending emails like every two days. Uh, sometimes there's a three-day separation. Uh, someday, sometimes just a one-day separation. And, and that's because of the, the timeliness of, of them signing up. This is when you can get them. And we also know from nurturing research from Salesforce that people, they research products in sprints. They're not doing it linearly spaced out over time. There's a period when they're doing research and they're doing tons of research. They're doing comparisons, product reviews, et cetera, all at once. It's not, it's not a once a week stop and go process. So that's, there's a logic behind why you would send emails very rapidly. Okay, so product tip two, and then you separate the product tips with a case study. Case studies we know from this excellent article from Harvard Business Review are the best type of content marketing and the content that potential buyers actually want to consume. And there's a number of psychological reasons for that. Uh, social proof, uh, trusting experts, it's they're more likely to trust somebody that is similar to the to the business they're in or or the type of consumer they are then they're going to trust you because you're just trying to sell them something all right so another product tip followed by a case study two days later and then ultimately a another case study and a call to action to upgrade so pushing them to sell before the trial ends now if you're if you have a freemium model you don't necessarily need to be that aggressive you don't have to use the the end of the trial to push people to buy. You can just always have the buy option at the bottom. And you could just have an email dedicated to why you should sign up for a pro account or why you should upgrade. It's up to you. There's no, there's nothing set in stone about this is how you have to do it. Now, the other thing is that if your trial is time-based, then this, this cadence makes sense, right? You, you want them, you can use the constraint of your trial ending as a reason to push people to upgrade. But if your trial is usage based, then uh, they're going to reach that wall anyways of, uh, you know, however many transactions they can do in the product or actions in general. And, and that will hopefully be an opportunity to push them to upgrade or, or buy a more advanced version or advanced subscription. All right. So that was one model. Here is a second one from Dan Martell, who is an influencer in the, the SaaS space, SaaS consulting space. He recommends a welcome email, uh, a second email that's training. So a lot of companies, what they do is they offer sometimes online courses or mini courses that go beyond just teaching about the product, but actually sort of teach you how to be successful in whatever space that the the product operates under that's something to consider too because that can be part of your marketing funnel email three is a case study tips and tricks similar to the product tips and features we were talking about earlier an offer to help so this is getting people to contact support to answer any questions i i think this is great and especially if, if your product is in very early stages, you basically want people to respond because you're getting market research. You're getting feedback on the product that you can use to improve it. Now, in the long run with product-led growth, you maybe don't want a lot of people responding and contacting because it's less scalable, right, to have humans interacting. Uh, it might be something like a chat bot or directing people to a help desk or something like that with how-to articles or how-to videos. But uh, for most companies, this is great, uh, getting people to contact support, because if they're, if they're not onboarded properly, then it's highly unlikely that they're going to be good users or super users of your product. Email six, make an offer. So it might be a time-sensitive offer like a 15% off or something like that if you buy tomorrow. And email seven, celebrate or learn. So it's great if they do buy at, at this point, you can celebrate, or if, even if they just become a, a PQL, so a product qualified lead, somebody who's reached a tipping point in the product where they're highly likely to buy and they become super users. 
but in other cases, they maybe abandon the product. So that's an opportunity to learn. And you can send out a survey being like, hey, just tell us why you didn't like the product. A, B, or C were the reasons or other. And you can get qualitative feedback that way. All right. So I've just presented two general frameworks for how to approach email nurturing after people sign up for your free account. But um, it's not the ideal. The ideal approach is not these time-based funnels. What is, is what Lincoln Murphy, who is another influencer in the, the SaaS space, advises. If you're st still sending emails based on time sequence instead of triggered by actual user behavior, you're 100% doing it wrong. Now, Lincoln's being a bit hyperbolic, I think, by saying you're 100% doing it wrong. Uh, I would say maybe that's true if you have tons of data to support doing something differently. But uh, he has a point, which is that if you're just sending kind of a one-size-fits-all sequence of educational emails to people, you're probably sending irrelevant information to a lot of people. But if you can see the behavior that they're taking in the product or the behavior they're taking in the emails, and you can see, okay, what features they're interested in, what use cases they're responding to in the emails, then you can serve them emails based on that. So you're, you're, you're giving a truly personalized experience. Okay, so nurturing people after they signed up, the ideal approach to, to t take with it is based on triggers that are driven by user behavior or driven by predictive analytics. So you can, you either see what they're actually doing or because you have tons of data, the, the behaviors that you are able to observe, you're able to predict what they'll probably do next. So for example, in data analytics, we have next product to buy predictions. If you saw that they bought SOC A, then uh, based on predictive analytics, you know that they're probably going to buy shirt B, something like that. So you can send it an email that pushes them to buy shirt B. But for most companies, it, in the small revenue space, they just don't have enough data to make those predictions accurately and they just end up guessing, which uh, is not a good approach. Okay, so some specific examples of this. If someone engages in a specific feature in your app, you send them an email and an in-app message that deepen their understanding of that feature. If someone has signed up but hasn't installed your software, so a lot of the products that you're selling may have to be installed, you send them emails educating them on how to stall the app. So you need to look at the buyer journey with your product and figure out where the drop-off point is. And if you can see that they didn't install your software or they didn't sign up or they didn't validate something or they didn't set up an integration, then that should be the trigger to send a specific email about whatever that barrier is. You need to identify the barriers and fix them. And one way to do that is trigger-based emails. All right, another example. If your analytics suggests that a user's in-app behavior is predictive of abandonment, okay, so maybe they're not using the product a lot, or maybe they haven't set up enough integrations, or they're not getting any sales, so this would be behavior predictive of abandonment, you interject with a phone call from a customer success manager. So that should be a trigger in your customer relationship management system, perhaps to get the CSM to actually call this prospect to fix the problem. Or it could just be an automated personalized email from the CSM that says, hey, do you need any help? Please just respond. Okay, so a company that I noticed did this, and I'm not saying they did it flawlessly, but they did it better than most companies, is Brand24. So Brand24, I logged into their software, I did a search and the search that I was interested in in their product was for dictation software. And then they provided a bunch of examples of where dictation software shows up on the internet. The emails that I got from Brand24 after that were not just generic stuff about their product or about the category that they operate in or about, about the kind of business I'm in. They were very, very specific. The emails that they were sending were related to the exact query I had searched, dictation software. 
And you may have seen this before when you search for a job. Okay, you search for a job for marketing manager on, I don't know, maybe Glassdoor or Indeed or something, or, or LinkedIn. What are the emails that you're getting? They're about marketing manager positions. They're personalized to what you were searching. It's not, oh, here's a bunch of jobs in the US or here's a bunch of jobs you might be interested in. It's here's a bunch of jobs that are directly tied to the behavior that you took in our job search. That is the gold standard for nurturing. I want to give you some examples of the sign-up process for your product because this is one of the key junctures where you either make it or you lose it. So Calendly, I think, does a pretty good job. If we go to their homepage, you see that all you have to do to sign up is enter your email here and hit sign up. You do not even have to click a sign up button, go to a separate page where you put it first name, your last name, your email address, confirm your email address, make sure that it's a work email address, enter all this information. It's just right here on the homepage. You enter your email, sign up. Now, one thing I want to highlight, and this is something that a lot of companies don't do enough of, is addressing objections. So the key objection that's preventing me from entering my email address might be that I'm going to be asked to enter a credit card and have to cancel the subscription later or maybe it's not actually free there's some sort of trick where in step two uh, i have to pay for it and they're addressing those objections front and center okay so let's uh let's go through to see what happens elsewhere in the sign up process now one thing that they're doing is they're pushing you to do the social sign up because they know that if you have to go through the email process. It's a bit lengthy. It's a bit painful. It's a bit of a, a friction sticking point. So what they're getting you to do is to try to sign up with Google. Now, some companies, they have other social sign on. Personally, I prefer using my Gmail for uh, mostly everything. I don't want to have my Facebook tied to things. I don't want my phone number tied to things. Just let's just use the email address. And that, that's what they're doing here. They're making it very easy to sign up. Canva, another company that's doing the same thing. They're giving you social sign-up options. So sign up with Google, sign up with Facebook, sign up with email, or if you already have an account, log in. I, I like this. I like that they're giving people options. Some people probably prefer using their Facebook or their email instead of just the, their Google account. They're also doing some objection handling. So it's free forever. You don't need to worry. You don't, you're not going to be pressured into buying it just to continue using the product. Uh, what if you don't have design experience? Oh, it's not a problem. And they're also just doing this little thing here saying that you can create designs and documents in minutes. So it's there's not going to be huge learning curve there the way there might be with, say, Adobe Creative Suite. The other thing that I think is clever that Canva does is this is a, a product-led growth freemium product. I love the product. Canva is amazing, amazing product. If you haven't tried it, you have to try it. As somebody that had used Adobe Creative Suite for years, if not decades, uh, I really think this product is a game changer. I can't wait for the company to go public so I can buy some stock. Now, what they're doing in the sign-up process is they're already promoting the Canva Pro. So they've already gotten you to sign up for the free account. Now they're, now they're saying, hey, hey, you can get this bonus. You can get the free the Canva Pro free for 30 days. And they're, they're highlighting some key advantages to this. Now, it's really interesting because they're not waiting until later in the user experience to promote it. They're doing it now and they're, they're saying it's free. So you don't actually have to pay to try Canva Pro. You can try it right now and uh, be charged later. So very interesting, but they also give you the option of uh, basically skipping. Okay, the other thing they're doing, and I see this a lot with product-led growth companies, we saw this with ClickUp, is they're getting you to try to invite other people. Again, one of the key keys to success with product-led growth, particularly on the freemium side, is are the people who are not paying creating value? By the way, they create value is helping with network effects, helping with word of mouth, helping to get other people involved. And what they're getting you to do is invite other people to the team. So I, I've done this. I, I've worked with other people on Canva projects, and it's pretty cool. I, I'd be interested to see the data on how successful it is. Um, but 
yeah, pretty new, pretty, pretty cool. They also give you options, right? You can enter the emails here or get the invitation link. The design is flawless, uh, well-balanced, good use of gray and contrast, not too much contrast between the, the text and the imagery. And again, reinforcing uh, some key benefits here with the, uh, the checkpoints on the right. Another company that is a good example of the sign-up process would be Kickstarter. Okay, so often what people do with product-led growth is first step is get people to sign up for an account. But the challenge I see is people actually don't like signing up for accounts. And we know from market research with things like surveys, people don't want to provide their name, their sex, their location, their email, all this boring information. So what have market researchers done to address that? They put those questions at the end of the survey. That is best practices. The beginning of the survey is the more interesting stuff. Like, uh, tell me about how much you fly or tell me what what you love or hate about this product. That's the stuff people actually enjoy doing. And Kickstarter realizes that. They realize the value can be put up front by getting people to start the project. And then later on, we can ask them for the boring information. So bring your creative project to life, start a project. Okay, it's not create an account and start the project. Okay, let's set you up. So you pick your category. Oh, I wanna create a book. I wanna create a game. I wanna create a video, something like that. And then uh, later on, okay, now they're asking for your name, your email, your password. Okay, the boring stuff comes later. I've already committed to providing all this information. So, all right, fine, I may as well complete the process. And that, that's a good application of marketing psychology is incrementalism and asking people to do the boring stuff at the end. Okay, another cool thing that I noticed with Kickstarter after signing up, and I don't know if this is triggered based on my behavior or if everybody experiences this, but a few days went by and then I got this email. Confirm your identity. Before you can submit your Kickstarter for real, you need to confirm your identity and submit your bank information, account information. Okay, very boring process. I don't want to do this. Oh, I got to find my transit number. I got to go through all this junk. But Kickstarter, they did a cool little trick, which was waiting to get me to do this. It wasn't up front because if it was, if it were right here, I'd be like, forget it. And then I would just, I would close Chrome, I'd leave and maybe never come back. But because it was later on, it's like, okay, you're putting these steps into bite-sized components where I'm actually highly likely to do it because I've already committed this far. I've already hit the creating account. Okay, I'll go, now I'll go through the verification process. They probably also realize that people don't want to do this in the initial sign-up stage, but they will be willing to do it later. Another psychological concept I like to talk about is the idea of desiring closure, desiring completeness. People generally like things to come to a nice little neat packaged ending and, and there's full closure there. There's not a lot of loose ends. And sometimes this isn't actually a good thing. So in psychology, Chi, when you have a psychological problem, there is a tendency to want to resolve everything, to settle everything, but this isn't really healthy. Uh, people uh, should actually be okay with there being a lot of loose ends because that's uh, largely how you move forward. And it's pretty much impossible to get closure with everything. Uh, unfortunately, some things happen in life that are irreversible and it's just impossible to get closure. But uh, this tendency to desire closure is something that gets embedded in products and embedded in marketing. So, for example, I've been watching this show called Queen of the South. Now, uh, without giving you too much spoilers, basically the show starts with the conclusion, which is a, a woman who uh, ends up becoming this very powerful person. And uh, but th that's the ending of, of the, the series. But. Then we're brought to kind of the beginning of the series, which is her as a kind of a humble person that doesn't have a lot of power. Maybe she's a bit meek. Um, and a lot of shows, novels, etc., they start this way. They start with the ending. And I've always found it odd because I'm like, well, I, I don't want to know the ending. I, I want to know. Uh, I want to be pushed through the story and surprised by what happens at the end. But I think it's a little trick. And what, what it does is it, it keeps people 
desiring to watch episode after episode to get that closure, to figure out, well, how did we get from A to Z? What? How did she go from a meek person to this very powerful person? Now, we also see this a lot in Korean dramas. So I've watched a lot of Korean dramas, and they're very good at uh, creating this habit formation. And the way they do it, largely, is with cliffhangers. So the episode ends with something really dramatic. Okay, somebody's about to attack somebody, or somebody's about to kiss somebody, or somebody finds out a secret about somebody else. So what they're doing is they're playing on the psychological tendency to want closure. And that's something that you see embedded in products, you see it embedded in applications as well, where it's like you're you're about to advance to the next level or the next stage in the app. There's kind of a, a progression bar. And the idea is you want to get closure. Now, uh, often this is kind of broken up into mini closure sections. So it's like level one, you get a star. Okay, level two, you get a, a a gold medal level three you get a platinum medal so it's not it's not getting the closure that that's too far away there's little closures that you experience uh so for example after the cliffhanger of episode one you get a little bit of closure but then um you know there's another cliffhanger that happens that's even bigger um so that this helps to improve your marketing people they want to keep watching and um a lot of people that i find have Effective at this are YouTube influencers, YouTube celebrities, and what they'll do is they'll they'll give you a little teaser in the beginning of the video and be like, "Oh, here's what you're gonna learn if you just if you just continue watching. I'm gonna show you the three steps." And then there's kind of a delay where you have to keep watching in order to get those three steps. This is a trick that people use, and uh, it's extremely effective. One of the biggest mistakes that I see in marketing is that marketers ask for information up front that prospective customers or users really do not like providing. So for example, with surveys, a lot of people will ask as the first set of questions demographic information such as what is your name, how old are you, where do you live, what's your sex, etc. People don't like this. It's annoying. It's not interesting. Really, what you should be doing is jumping into the interesting questions, such as uh, how often do you use this product, what's your opinion of this, etc. And at the very end of the survey, that's when you ask the annoying questions, such as uh, demographics. So the better approach is to jump straight in. And I'm just looking at this example with the, the Myers-Briggs personality test. You click take the test, and then immediately they start asking you questions, such as you you regularly make new friends, you know, or do you agree or do you disagree or are you somewhere in between? They're not asking, what is your name? Create an account with 16personalities.com. If they do ask it, it's probably going to be the last set of questions. So there are a number of psychological principles at, at play here. Um, one of the, the most important is loss aversion. So if you've already committed to uh, answering this question, this question, this question, you, you kind of feel like you're, you're you almost own the end result of this survey. Um, so not giving this final set of questions, which may be your name, age, sex, et cetera, prevents you from uh, retaining what you sort of already own. Like you're 90% you're of the way there. You feel like you own it. Oh, if you, if you just do that final sprint, you'll, you'll not lose that time that you've already invested. Uh, another important concept here is incrementalism. So if you've already committed to answering this question, you're more likely to commit to this, to this, to this, and eventually to the annoying questions at the end or to sign up for an account. So that applies to surveys, which is a common thing that you're going to do in product marketing. Now, the other thing is when you're trying to get people to sign up for a, a free account or even just to to sign up to, to buy something, to actually pay for something. And often what people do is they'll have the call to action on their website as instead of take the test, it'll be something like sign up for a free account. And then the first thing you see is what is your name? You know, maybe your credit card number. What is your password? That That is... Um, it's okay, but it's probably better to jump people into the product or into the uh, the value that you create. So for example, LegalZoom.com, 
Um, you notice their, their call to action here is not sign up for an account, it's check availability. So what do you want to call your LLC? Well, let's, let's call, call it Decker Corp. Check availability. So you see what they're doing. They're, they're showing you value before they're asking for something in return. So I'm going to put in the state here as California search. Okay, so then they start asking for these, these annoying questions like my email and phone number. Now, this is really great be best practices is get people committing early on and before you put up this barrier, this, this, it's not a paywall, but it's a commitment wall where you got to provide information and people are like, ah, oh, you're going to spam me. This is annoying. I already have a million sign up accounts with passwords, etc. I don't want to do that. Okay. So there's another psychological principle here. So it's not just loss aversion. It's not just incrementalism or in other words, like small commitments building up to bigger commitments. But the other thing is habit formation. So when you're trying to build a habit, you're trying to get people using your product. Um, one of the things that you need to do is shorten the distance between the problem that the person has and the, the reward. So in this case, the problem may be uh, I need to create a, a corporation to protect myself uh, legally. And the reward is having the corporation set up. So by jumping into the question of whether your corporation name is available, you're, you're kind of shortening the distance there. It, it feels like I'm, I'm Wow, I'm, I'm already checking for the name. I'm kind of almost at the reward. Whereas when you ask something like, what is your name? Um, what is your sex? What's your password? That, that makes it seem like a longer process. And there's all sorts of ways that this plays out in the product world. So for example, you notice when you go to the app store, you're not asked first to create an account. So for example, if you download a video game or you're looking for a productivity app, the, the call to action is typically install. It's you're getting people to commit to getting the product before you're asking them to create an account. And then when you ask them to create an account, then you start asking them to pay for something like premium offerings. So it's easier to throw people into your product or to throw people into value before you start asking for something in return, such as creating an account or uh, entering your credit card information. Another key concept in marketing is what I call visibility. So when things are salient, when they're visible, they're more likely to spread. And a lot of that has to do with kind of mob mentality or sheep-like behavior, where if you see people doing something, you're more likely to do it yourself. And an example of this is the fact that Apple put their logo on the back of the laptops. And this is largely because people will see you using an Apple product and they're more likely to use it as well. So if somebody's in Starbucks, oh, this writer's using uh, a Macintosh laptop. Okay, well, uh, I'm more likely to do it then. Another example is with the COVID pandemic, a lot of people wear masks. Now, masks are not actually the most effective means of preventing COVID. It's things like hand washing. But uh, the real power of masks is that it's a, it's a powerful marketing tool. It's very visible. When you see people wearing a mask, it projects a message of responsibility, of social cohesion, of this is the right thing to do, this is the noble thing to do. And you as an individual, it kind of puts out to the world, I care about this issue, I care about other people, I am wearing a mask. Now, your hand washing, that's, that's a private thing. You're doing that in the bathroom and maybe at most two people see you doing it and, and nobody knows whether you're actually washing your hands for 20 seconds. So the, the symbolism here, it's, it's the visibility that's important from a marketing perspective, and that's how you help things spread. So when you're creating your marketing communications, you want to think about how can you use visibility to help enhance the, the social proof, to enhance virality. Another example of this is when an email is sent from an iPhone, there might be a little 
a thing in the footer that says sent by an iPhone. Well, uh, perhaps when you're selling something like dictation software, you could say dictate it by whatever your brand name is or uh, this integration powered by whatever your product is. Putting your logos in ways that are visible to uh, others rather than to the user uh, is another effective means of doing that. So always look for ways to make your product visible so that it's not just a private experience by a single user. How do you change someone's mind? Well, that question is answered by the esteemed professor at the Wharton School. His name is Jonah Berger. He's very popular for writing the book Contagious, which talks about how to make your marketing go viral. And in his new book, The Catalyst, he's narrowing down to the question of how do you change someone's mind, which is an element of persuasion and influence. And one of the key concepts he's pushing is that persuading people or changing their minds has less to do with pushing them and more to do with reducing the barriers or the roadblocks that are holding them back from changing their mind. So he has this framework, and I'm going to walk through it with some examples, that is abbreviated as REDUCE. So reactants, endowment, distance, uncertainty, and corroborating evidence. So let's start with reactants. Now, one of the key concepts that he's talking about is that when you want to move something in the real world, like a chair, you push it, and the chair does not push back. So it does what you tell it or command it to do. Now, the problem with people is that there's a tendency for them to push back. And I would say that this is probably more true in countries where there's low power distance. So how do you deal with a situation where pushing is not effective in moving people in the direction you want to go? Well, what you do is you try to provide those people with a sense of agency where they believe that they are making the decision themselves as an individual. And there are various techniques that highly influential people and marketers do to make this happen. And one of those is giving options. So often what people do is they, they provide only one option. And that is, um, it could be, I need you to do this, or it could be something on a marketing website, like the only offer that you can take the company on is doing a demo. But when you provide choices, so for example, a salesperson who says, option A is $2,000, and you get this, this, and this, or option B is $5,000 and you get the benefits of X, Y, and Z. And perhaps there's even a third option. Option C, the premium version is $11,000 and you get A, B, C, D, E, whatever. So by providing even just a narrow set of options, what you're doing is you're creating the sense that somebody has agency. They have a choice. You're actually controlling the situation. You are persuading them by deciding what is the consideration set? Okay, it's like going to a voting booth and you have some agency, but, but ultimately the people that are on the ballot have already been chosen by uh, a different group of people. So you, you're not, you don't have full agency, but you have some limited amount of choice. And people are more likely to buy into your solution or whatever it is you're trying to convince them of when they feel like they played a part in creating the ultimate decision that was made rather than just being uh, served a solution on a silver platter. Okay, the second concept here is endowment. Now, this is one of the most well-established concepts in psychology in general, and it's very relevant to marketing psychology, and that is that people are stuck to the status quo and they really value what they already have, and th there's a lot of loss aversion. So people really don't like losing what they already own and the amount that they suffer from losing something is much more than they gain from gaining something. So what you want to do when you're persuading people is rephrase things away from this is what you gain and more towards this is what you will lose if you do nothing. Or you're going to gain back what you already lost. So you were... Uh, maybe maybe you lost two million dollars. Well, we're going to help you help you recapture that. And 
Um, perhaps if you do nothing now, well, you're going to lose another $500,000 next year and then another $6,000 a year after that. So what we're going to do is we're going to prevent you from losing that money in the future. And it doesn't have to be money. It could be time. So for example, you're, you're wasting a lot of time typing medical records every day. Well, if you start using our solution, you're going to regain that time back. You're going to have an extra 20 hours a week or, or something like that. Okay. The third element here is distance. So people tend to not value things when they're far in the future. So there's kind of a, an element of risk there, an element of uncertainty where it's like, well, okay, that could happen. We could use the, you know, those benefits, but there are a lot of things that could happen in the meantime. So one way that you, you bridge that barrier of distance preventing people from, from going in the direction you want is you ask for less. So you use incrementalism. So let's talk, instead of talking about what happens a year from now, let's talk about what happens a, a month from now. And then when a month goes by, okay, now let's talk about the quarter and then we can talk about the year. The fourth element here is uncertainty. So whenever people are trying something new, there's an element of uncertainty, there's an element of risk, there's an element of this is not tangible. This is this is a concept. Okay, maybe maybe it'll be helpful in theory, but in the real world when it when push comes to shove, when the the rubber hits the road, what's actually going to happen? So we see this a lot in the software space. The way you overcome that is with things like free trials with freemium solutions. And another thing that you can do is you reduce the upfront costs. So in the software industry, for example, you used to have to invest a lot of money to get the new software established. Now what we're happen what we're seeing is companies are not charging for onboarding. Onboarding is free. Uh, the product to some extent is even offered for free to a, a, a limited set of features or to uh, a usage based uh, restriction on how much they can use the product for free. So what you're doing is you're, you're reducing the investment that's required and the switching costs that are required to, to dive in and, and try your product. And you see this in the grocery stores too. They'll have free samples. So when somebody believes that their product fundamentally tastes better, it is a higher quality, then what they'll do is they'll offer free samples in the grocery store. And then your the uncertainty with trying something new is reduced. People are like are more confident in buying your product after having tried it. Now, corroborating evidence. This is where one of the key concepts in marketing comes into play, which is the idea that people are fundamentally social animals and we're basically like sheep and we prefer to do what other people have done. It increases our confidence and it makes it more certain that this is the direction that we should go because other people are showing us that. And, and reinforcement, it could be people, it could be professionals, it could be further evidence. Social proof case studies are one of the most effective means of, of creating the kind of evidence that changes people's minds. The other thing to note is that when you're using this kind of evidence, when you concentrate them close in time, they have a, a higher impact. So for example, I, I was talking to a colleague of mine who did marketing to small, medium sized businesses, and he did a number of different tests. What he found was that a frequency of around six during the campaign period, which is about uh, one to two months long, was the the sweet spot for convincing somebody to sign up for the product so what, what's that sh what is that showing it's showing that it's not just how much evidence you have or um how many case studies you have or how many people are talking about your solution it's how dense is that information being received so if 10 people are telling you to buy a product or are vouching for a product within a one week span or within a one month span, then your mind is kind of tricking itself into thinking, oh, well, there's, there's a super trend here. Everybody's on board with this. Now, maybe it's just 10 people, but the, there is a perception that there's a, a pattern there that can't be refuted. Whereas if you took those 10 case studies or, or 10 pieces of social proof and spread them out over a year, they have less of an impact. So this is a great framework for helping you change people's minds. I would say it's particularly effective when people 
are leaning towards a direction that is not yours. So maybe it's a competing product or maybe it's just sticking with the status quo, which is one of the biggest challenges to overcome. If people have been doing something for a long time and they're in the habit of doing, they're going to be very resistant to trying something else unless you use some different elements to convince them, to persuade them that changing the status quo is worth the effort, worth the energy, worth the investment. I want to talk about a concept that salespeople have been aware of for a very long time, but marketers have been a little bit slow jumping on board. It's the concept of objection handling. So one of your key functions in marketing communications is to figure out what people are objecting to when it comes to trying, buying, or rebuying your product, and then to address those objections through your communications. I'm going to start with a specific example, and then we'll, we'll speak more broadly on this topic. So uh, this fellow, Michael, I saw his LinkedIn post. I thought it was great. And what he's talking about is that for every call to action that he's listed here, there are objections that are going through people's minds. And you can address those objections immediately within the call to action. So for example, start free. Uh, the objection is uh, it's going to ask for my credit card. So you can simply put no CC required, and then people are, are more likely to do what you want them to do by uh, addressing that objection. Add a Gmail. I bet this is a hassle. They're highlighting here just one click. Get started. I bet it's expensive. Get started for just one dollar. Object addresses that objection. Try Prisma. I don't have time. Try Prisma in five minutes. Or you could say something like, uh, five minute installation or free onboarding or something like that. So you can see here that people are more likely to take action when that defense mechanism is shut down. The defense mechanism, that reflexive thought of, oh, there's, there's something behind the curtain here. I've been through this before. They're going to ask for my credit card or, or there, there's some functionality that they're not offering that competitors have been a challenge to work with in the past. So let, let's look a little more broadly at this. Now, the first thing that you really need to do is research. So um, research the barriers to try your product. So that's to, to sign up for the free trial or to do the demo or whatever your freemium offering might be. Uh, also, the different barriers to actually buy it. So once they're familiar with the product, they may be resistant to buying it because of price or whatever. And uh, basically just looking at various stages in your marketing funnel to figure out, okay, where, where is the breakdown here? What's the resistance? What are the objections at each of those stages? And here are some common ones. One is price, which is pretty obvious. Price is going to be a big turnoff for people. Uh, competition. Well, if your competitors have a superior or better known product, then that's going to be the default option. Timing. Oh, we, um, we can't do it this quarter. We don't have budget this month features maybe you just don't have the features or simply that the prospect is not aware of the problem that you solve or they're not aware of your product or product category enough they're not informed enough to know that that's the solution to their problem okay so there are different ways to surface these objections uh, one is to simply look at your your crm system and look at the lost reason codes okay so why was the opportunity lost uh, why were the leads falling off the funnel. Uh, you can also ask sales. So sales is directly speaking to prospective customers and you can figure out what the objections are. Similarly, you can talk to customer success to figure out why current customers have abandoned your product. You can also pay prospects for their input. So this is especially true when people go dark, uh, they, they're not responding to the sales team, they're probably not gonna respond to you, but they will if you offer them a $100 Amazon gift card. It's, it's just a basic uh, concept in research that you pay people for their time. Uh, another quick hack that I like to do is to ask questions on Quora or in Reddit groups or Facebook groups, because here you can often get very uh, high level people that are, are difficult to get a hold of uh, generally uh, for things like surveys, but here you can get information for free most of the time. Sometimes they might respond and say, oh, my hourly rate is $100. And yeah, then you can pay them for their time. Okay, so some common objections might be, why do you uh, need my credit card? You know, what, are you providing any reason? Uh, do you actually need to collect credit card information? Uh, they might think that your product won't work with my software. So you can talk about uh, things like your partners and your integrations to address that. 
um, my developer or my CFO or my sales team needs to approve, uh, you can address that in, in various ways. You can have a whole section of your website or whole brochure that speaks to the, the developer or the needs of whatever uh, persona we're talking about here. Uh, my needs are too specific. So they might think that because they have custom software, uh, the integration won't work. Um, so there are ways that you can cater to that. You can say, oh, we provide customizations or we uh, will do free uh, integrations for you. We will train you on how to do it and, and make sure that it's a customized solution. Or they might say something like, uh, my software already does that or whatever product I'm using already does what, what you're doing. Well, you can do things like comparison uh, pages that talk about how your product it provides incremental value beyond the status quo, beyond what we're already using. Okay, so one of the main things that you need to do is just create content that addresses the objections. So for example, with price, you can have case studies that prove return on investment and cost savings. Timing, you can have time sensitive offered offers with scheduled follow ups. Competition, uh, I already mentioned competitive comparison charts, perhaps not just comparing you to one alternative product, but perhaps uh, 10 different products that are, are commonly used as alternatives to yours. Uh, features, well, that's why it's important to have new features announcements so that perhaps people that are uh, in your buying cycle but haven't purchased yet, um, news may change their opinion. It may make them more likely to actually buy your product if, if you provide a feature that was important to them. Product awareness, you could create a five minute video. Uh, this could be like a demo video. Uh, shoot this out through email, you could advertise it through LinkedIn, advertise it through Facebook, advertise it and promote it through organically through YouTube. And uh, one of the important objections that people are gonna have is that they're just not aware of the problem that they have. Uh, so you can use research to show uh, everybody in that industry or people that are very similar to you uh, have this problem and here are the, the data to support it. Similarly, if they're aware of the problem but not aware of the, your category of solution, you can use evidence to show that uh, your category of products is, is the best solution to their problem. One of the big conclusions that I've come to with this idea that people have a lot of objections is simply that you need more content to address those uh, uh, objections. Too often marketers try to be a little too superficial. They don't want to get into the details of the product and the details of the sales process. And they just kind of want to do this nice little storytelling uh, element to the marketing. But you really do need to get into those details if you want to persuade somebody to, to buy a product, which is the, the most challenging aspect of marketing, at least marketing communications. So the kinds of content is going to be talking about things like a money back guarantee, talking about things like no credit card required, doing detailed competitor comparisons, talking about integrations, doing price rationalization. So for example, talking about the total cost of ownership and calculating with very detailed specific case studies why the price is justified. Uh, talking about different security protocols to address things like, well, are you uh, even suitable for a Fortune 500 company to use this product? You're going to use extensive social proof. So it's not just the, the five-star reviews that you have on Captera or wherever. It's, it's also social proof from key influencers, okay? It's going to be social proof in terms of how much PR that you got in credible newspapers or uh, TV spots, things like that. You're going to talk about customizations. A lot of people are not going to buy your product because it's not customized to their specific needs. Well, you've got to talk about situations where customizations uh, are effective. You also have to address political appeals. So political appeals are going to be things like, oh, this is not just good for you, but your, your CTO is going to like it. Your entire marketing team is going to like it. The end users that are actually doing the data processing are going to like it. And the other thing is the ultimate objection is not now. Okay, We're, we don't have budget this quarter or we don't have time this week. So creating a sense of urgency using uh, different tactical elements, price sensitive offers, for example, is not necessarily easy to get, but it's effective to address uh, that key objection. 
Okay, so I'm going to show you a specific example of an ad that I ran that was pretty effective. And what we're starting with here is spending too much time on medical records. Okay, so this is one of the key problems that uh, people in the medical space have, particularly veterinarians uh, who I'm targeting in this case. Did you know speaking is five times faster than typing? Why not try a dictation app for veterinarians? Try talk to do free, no credit card required. And then I list uh, eight numbered points here. And then I have something at the bottom here. Okay, so let's start with the bottom. Talk to do is a game changer, Angela, veterinary medical director. So this is a form of social proof that proves uh, that, that these objections that I'm addressing have some weight to them. It's not just us talking. It's uh, also people in your industry talking. And then the bullet points largely are just about addressing objections. So whenever, have, whenever somebody advertises a, a free trial or a demo request, people immediately get defensive and they're like, oh, shoot. First thing is they're going to ask for a credit card. Okay, well, no credit card required. Okay, that's the second thing. And the second question they're going to ask in this industry is, is it going to work my practice management? Software. Okay, guaranteed to work with your practice management software. Okay, this person is one step closer to doing the free trial because I'm addressing the the objections uh, piece by piece. No special hardware required. Okay, you don't have to buy anything extra. All right. Well, uh, I have an accent. Is it going to work for me? Uh, no, it's not going to be a problem. Okay, it's going to cut your documentation time in half. This is a benefit. Uh, but people are immediately going to object and be like, well, is it really, or are you just exaggerating? Well, we have a direct quotation from a customer that said, that's what happened. Okay. It's very accurate. Uh, that's going to be a concern too. Is the dictation software accurate? Doesn't understand medical vocabulary. Yeah, it does. Uh, well, it's going to be a pain in the butt to install and use. It's easy to install and use. And, uh, and then lastly, I conclude with another benefit, which isn't addressing an objection, but um, I thought it was important to add that as kind of a tertiary point. So you can see that I, I piece by piece addressed each of the objections. Now, how did I find these objections? Well, uh, some of them is just looking through customer quotations. Uh, others are guessing or using logic. And one of the main things that I did was look at Quora. So I asked Quora, asked veterinarians, you know, why don't you use dictation software? And uh, that's a lot of what came out here in terms of advertising is just directly addressing those, the answers to that question. Okay, another thing is that objections come at different stages. So usually when we're talking about objections, it's in the sales space. So it's, you know, why am I not buying buy now? Why should I buy you instead of a competitor? Uh, but as a marketer, you need to think a little bit broader in, in terms of the time horizon. So there's gonna be objections to your offer. So what I mean here is your direct response offer, and that's your, your demo, your trial, your free consultation, uh, perhaps it's a gift card that you're giving away uh, to get people to talk to your sales team or to have a demo. It may be a sweepstakes giveaway, uh, you know, a chance to win something. Uh, so there's all sorts of reasons people object to this. One is they think, okay, well, you're never going to give us the award anyways. It's just a, um, a false promise. Uh, it's also, oh, if I give you your information, you're just going to spam me. You're going to pressure me into buying something. So you could say something like, okay, uh, there's no pressure. You're not going to be entered in the database. Just sit through a 30 minute demo. And then if you're not interested, that's it. There's no continued conversation from there. Okay. And then there's going to be objections to your product itself. And these are going to be things like uh, the price, the value, the specific features. Maybe you, you don't have compatibility. Maybe you don't offer the same features your competitors do. Now, the other way I like to think about stages of objections in terms of the level of awareness. So Often marketers just talk generally about awareness, and usually what they mean is brand awareness, but there's there are different stages, right? So some prospective customers are not even aware that they have a problem, the problem that you solve. Okay, so for them, uh, the way you address that objection is saying, okay, here's some proof to show that people like you have this problem. Here, here's the research on it. Other people are problem aware. So then it's more about educating them that, hey, the category of product that I sell is the solution to your problem, okay? And some people are aware of the solution. They're aware that, okay, whatever it is you're selling, you know, maybe it's medicine or maybe it's a software tool or maybe it's a, 
a wrench or power tool, whatever, that that's a solution, but they're not necessarily aware that your, your specific product, your brand is the best solution. So for them, you need to address that objection by looking at things like why they should choose you over a competitor. So think about the objections at various stages and create lots of more content to object all to address all of those. Word of mouth marketing is one of the most efficient ways to get people using your product and continuing to use your product. We know research from McKinsey shows that word of mouth is very effective at all the various stages in different markets and this is something that you can artificially stimulate so word of mouth is not just some spontaneous thing so what does mckinsey tell us about how you generate word of mouth well the way you do that is by focusing on influencers so people that have disproportionate clout they have uh, often large followings or it's just people that share information very frequently and you can use a lot of statistical techniques to uh, find those people if you have robust data, but uh, if you don't, I'm going to walk you through in a lecture how to identify influencers in kind of a very basic way that's completely free and uh, doesn't require buying any tools. Okay, so influencers, one of the best ways to generate word of mouth. Other ways are by embedding certain things into your product or into your website or into the product experience that promote shareability. A, a lot of Silicon Valley companies like Dropbox have done this. So they're stimulating word of mouth through their user base. Now there's also like affiliate programs that can be helpful for this. You get some sort of commission or incentive for sharing. Okay, so the third major way is virality. So creating viral content. Now I'm going to walk you through a framework on how to do that as well. One of the key drivers of likability and hence influence is familiarity. Things that we're more familiar with, we have a higher propensity to like. It may seem a bit counterintuitive because there are lots of people that maybe you don't like and the more that you see them you're kind of detested when you see them or you're reminded about whatever they did to you but in general we like people more when we're more familiar with them and the same is true when we're talking about brands same is generally true when we're talking about products so simply being exposed to something repeatedly over time increases the chances that people will like you and increases the chances that you'll be able to persuade or influence that person. And this is a little bit undervalued, I would say, in the marketing realm, because there's been this propaganda, I might call it, in favor of direct response types of marketing and away from brand awareness or brand marketing. But we do see that as you start to scale your marketing, the, the brand marketing the awareness marketing does yield a lot more benefit at scale. So one of the ways that you can implement this is by launching campaigns on Facebook that are optimized for ad recall. So making sure that people, for example, see your brand or your product promotion uh, once a day, once a week, once a month, something like that. So the frequency of your advertising is an important driver of whether you're able to influence the person. It's not just whether they respond immediately to your ad, but it's whether they've seen your ad multiple times. And it's a very undervalued when we look at attribution and optimization with advertising is often all that we're measuring is direct responses. So did people sign up for a webinar? Did they sign up for a demo? Did they uh, take you up on whatever your offer was? Maybe it was a price request or quote request, something like that. So one case that I, I looked at from a colleague of mine, he found that the ideal sweet spot for optimal customer acquisition was a frequency of around six and that's uh, for a campaign that was between one and two months. So as long as prospects saw you around six times, that was the most cost-effective way to acquire them as a customer. 
So it's all about familiarity. And that's why uh, branding and consistency becomes more important because if you're constantly changing what your brand imagery is or you're using different fonts or using a different stock photography, there's an inconsistency there that makes it very difficult to create familiarity, to create likability, and hence to uh, have enough influence over someone that they're willing to try your product, to buy your product, and to continue buying your product.